Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we have a special guest named Daryl, who is a Catholic convert from, well, a couple different places. So we'll just jump right into it and start talking about his journey and uh, and what led him into the Catholic Church. Daryl, how's it going? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good. Hey, thanks so much for coming on the show. You know, we had a mutual yeah. friend, Pete. I'm going to give a shout out, connect us. Uh, Pete's a fan of the podcast, so he'll be thrilled to to hear his own name. And uh, he said, hey, you got to interview this guy. And he connected us via email, and we started talking. And I was like, oh, yeah, I do got to interview this guy. You've got an incredible story, uh, and I think we'll all be excited to hear it. I'm sure just based on the thumbnail alone, people will probably click in and be like, I got to know what this is about. So, yeah, tell us how, how it all started. Yeah, people are probably going to be like, who is this crazy guy? <laughs> Yeah, they say that um, about me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got family members and everybody who are like, "What is going on?" So yeah, <laughs> no. Um, Pete's wonderful. Yeah, Pete emailed me and um, uh, I don't know, it was a couple months ago, and and said, "Hey, uh, got a guy I want you to talk to." And um, so he, we talked the next day, and um, he told me a little bit about your show, and I've been checking it out. So yeah, I'm excited to uh, to visit with you. Um, so yeah, just to tell you about our story. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm married, uh, got four children. Um, and, uh, uh, we were, I was raised in a uh, nominally Christian home. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, lived in South Carolina, um, the youngest of four, um, and, uh, grew up basically an only child. Um, my closest sibling in age to me is my sister and, uh, she's uh, 12 years older than me and I've got two brothers older than that. So, by the time I came along, um, my mom and dad were, um, I was a bit of a surprise, but, you know, I was, was raised by, by, both parents were there. Um, my dad was not really anything at that point in, in life when I was growing up. Um, he was uh, um, really into golf, and, and so Sundays for him were, were golfing. And my mom, um, she took me uh, to a Baptist church when I was growing up. And, uh, and I was baptized and um, uh, grew up in the, in, in the church till about the age of 11. Um, and so once I reached, you know, going on teenage years, um, my mom, I, I got too cool to go to church. Uh, you know, it, it, she um, you know, didn't, didn't I, I, I was giving her a hard time about going. And um, so she kind of gave up because she really didn't have the support of my father at that point. And so, you know, I wanted to spend Sundays hanging out with friends and, and so that's what they, that's what we did. Um, uh, but I was, you know, taught values. My I mean, growing up in the South, fairly conservative household. I was, I was taught good Christian values. You know, I didn't, uh, I believed God existed, but, um, uh, didn't really understand anything about doctrine, the Trinity. I mean, I was only like say 11 years old. Um, my prayers were the, were pretty much, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord, my soul to keep. And that was, you know, pretty much it. Um, and, and beyond that, and so once I hit teenage years, like a lot of teenagers, I was more concerned with you know, chasing girls and hanging out with my friends. And um, God was kind of an afterthought. Um, it just, and I would say by the time I reached college, I, I, I would have, looking back, I would consider myself like an agnostic atheist. Like mm -hmm. for all practical purposes, God had no effect on my life. Um, and that's kind of you know how I went through college. Would you say, so, so in your Baptist experience... Did they do like Sunday school or any sort of youth group or anything? Like what was your experience there? Yeah. I mean, we had, had Sunday school. There was really no youth group where I went. Um, mm. I, re I do remember my father, uh, my, my mother and father. I, I met a friend, had a friend who was going to another church and I don't remember what denomination it was, mm. um, but they, it was Protestant. Uh, I think they were more charismatic. Um, okay. And I, and I wanted to go to their youth group because their youth yeah. group had a <laughs> lot of kids. And my parents were like, nope, you're not going over there. That's strange, you know. So um, I didn't really have, have any youth group in the in the Baptist church I went to. I did go to Sunday school, but um, it, it, like I said, growing up, just didn't learn a whole lot. I mean, I, I never really read the Bible, um, hmm. you know, other than bits and pieces here and there. Um, and so, you know, by the, like, by the time I reached college, I, I, I didn't really have any formula, formation in, in any kind of doctrine. Um so yeah. in, in college, uh, I started dating a girl who was, um, at that point, we started dating. She was not involved in her church at all, um, but we started getting very serious. And towards the 
the end of, of college, I went to school, um, my last two years of college, I went to school in DC, uh, George Washington University, uh, which was a, an awesome change from growing up in South Carolina to go to a big city like that. And just, you know, that nice. adventure. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but we, we started getting pretty serious and she started wanting to go back to church, uh, to her okay. church, which was the Mormon church or the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Okay. Today, they don't like to be referred to as Mormons. Right. Um, but so, so L the LDS church and, um, and she started inviting me to go with her. So hmm. I was like, all right, well, you know, it's important to you. I'm uh, you know, no big deal to me. I'll, I'll go with you occasionally. So I started going hmm. to church with her occasionally. And, um, as we got more and more serious in our relationship, she said, uh, you know, if th we're going to take this to the next level marriage, you're going to have to kind of start, you know, considering this. So I started taking the, what they call the discussions. See the way, um, the Mormon church works. Um, everybody here is probably familiar with, you know, you have two missionaries that'll come by your house and, you know, start oh, yeah. uh, talking to you and introduce you to the faith. And they could be, you know, female, they could be male, but they, they go out in pairs. And um, so I started taking the discussions while I was um, a junior in college. And um, uh, I get started doing that uh, pretty seriously, uh, con you know, considering the faith. But while I was in college, it, I, I didn't fully embrace it at that point. Um, after I graduated, graduated from school, um, she and I were, were talking about marriage. And so... I took the discussions probably for like the fourth time. <laughs> I, I was drilling the missionaries on, on understanding what, you know, what the church taught. And I can say that at that point, I actually did have a real conversion to, to the LDS faith. Um, hmm. it, it, uh, the, what they teach is that there's a promise that they give you. It's um, in the book of Mormon that if you will take what they're teaching you and you will pray about it and ask God if it's true or not, that God will prompt you or will, will, will reveal the truth of it to you by what they call a burning in the bosom, which mm. means essentially that you'll have a spiritual witness that what they're teaching you is true, that Joseph Smith was a prophet, okay. that the, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the only true church on the face of the earth. Mm. Um, and so I, I actually did, did experience that. You know, I had mm. had a, a, a conversion to, to the LDS faith. Um, looking back on it, you know, like at that point, I, I, like I said, I'd never really read the Bible. Um, I had never, uh, really researched the history of Christianity at all. Um, I, I could not have told you anything about, you know, any Christian saint, um, um, at, at all. So I knew, I, I knew nothing about the history of the church. Um, so, but I did get a witness, you know, to the, the spiritual truthfulness of, of, of the LDS church, the, that young lady and I, um, our relationship did not work out. You know, we ended up breaking up, but I continued my involvement in, in the, in, in the church. Um, and, uh, uh, really enjoyed it at that, at that point I was attending a singles ward, um, in, in the, in the LDS church, they, they call their, uh, deno their, their congregations, they're called wards. Um, and, uh, the, oh, the, so ward the whole that I ward to, for single people. Oh yeah. That's not, that's not a, uncommon at all. Okay. That's not a bad idea actually. If you're like, that's a good mixer, I bet. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, re it's really, it's, it, it's typically in the larger cities that they do mm -hmm. that. Um, that makes you know, sense. like DC, Atlanta. And, um, I mean, it, it, all the events that happen in, in the congregation, you know, they're all mm -hmm. geared towards, you know, younger people. Um, and it's where people are looking for, uh, their husbands and wives, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're looking to start a family. And once they start a family, they're not allowed to attend the singles ward anymore. They yeah, have to move on to a regular ward. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, it's, it's, it's really, that's really interesting. Um, Dar so, I'm curious, Daryl, when you were, so when you're in college and you're kind of starting to investigate, you said you had to go through those discussions four times. Mm -hmm. What was it? It seems like, was there like hesitation or were there things you didn't understand or didn't agree with? And then what do you think it was that finally pushed you over into saying, okay, Mormonism is true. Aside from, I mean, you had that experience a little bit, but was it like, what was your wrestling about? Was it intellectual or what, what was kind of going on there? Um, you know, the first couple of times that I took them, I was, I was in, in college and, um, you know, she and I, uh, she and I were dating. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I would say that at first, obviously when I started taking them, it was more to make her happy. You know, it, it was really, gotcha. um, 
I, I, I really cared about her and our, our, our relationship in order for it to progress. This was something that was extremely important to her. So it, it, it I wanted, wanted it to be important to me, but I was also involved in college life. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so there were other things, other distractions, you know, and, and things that I was, I was, and so I would just kind of finish the discussions and, and, you know, talk to the missionaries and then just kind of blow it off. And, um, then, you know, a few months would go by and I'd kind of go through that process again. Now the, the missionaries, they, they change them out that you don't have typically have the same missionaries who stay right. in a geographical area for extended periods of time. So it wasn't like I met with the same, same missionaries, you know, three or four times it was different ones. Um, but the, the, the kicker for me, I think after school was, I was, I, my, my thoughts about the future had changed. You know, I was no longer in that school environment. I was not working, Mm -hmm. trying to support myself, trying to start was, was, you know, thinking about the future. And honestly, you know, was, was looking like, Hey, I'd like to get married. I'd like to kind of get going in life. And, um, so started thinking about, you know, long-term, uh, uh, aspects of my life a lot, a lot deeper, a lot more deeply. Yeah. And I mean, you said it was like a, like a full on genuine conversion too. this wasn't just cause this cute girl's asking you to be Mormon. I mean, you had an ex- a very real experience. It sounds like that made you think this was the truth. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I really did. I mean, I, it, 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 it wasn't like, you know, had a, a, you know, God appear to me or anything like that, but I would say that in my heart, it was more like, like, this is true. Um, and, 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 some of that, as I come to find out later, and we'll talk about later in my, in my story, some of it is kind of self-fulfilling. If you want it to be true and you're meeting a lot of nice people in this church and they're embracing you, which they are, mm-hmm. um, they, 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 you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a really close tight knit community. And when you come become a part of that community, um, you feel, you know, the care that other people have for you. And so that can really have an effect on, 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 on you. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, some of it's like, so if you, if, if you want it to be true and you pray about it and, and, and you're searching and you really have nothing concrete to compare it against, hmm. um, you know, to, to kind of look at factually and say, is this factually true or is it, you know, a nice story? Right. Um, and so, you it, know, it, it, lo- looking back on it, obviously my understanding of what happened to me at that time is dramatically changed. Sure. Um, yeah, exactly different sense. from what I thought it was. But I mean, yeah, you had, you were, you were, uh, it sounds like you were sincere in the moment, you know, and then, so then you, then you became, you became LDS and yeah, tell us mm-hmm. about what happens next. So, you know, I, com- I converted to the LDS church and like I said, I was attending a singles ward and I uh, met this beautiful um, young lady um, who uh, we started dating um, and uh, uh, and she was raised, um, LDS. She came from, you know, a, a family that was, uh, um, had taught her the faith. Um, she had, uh, she was finishing up her master's degree, uh, there in Northern Virginia, George Mason. Um, and, uh, she and I started dating, um, and we, uh, fell in love and, and, and got married. Um, and so, you know, it, it, she, she was looking for a nice Mormon young man. And, you know, I, like I said, I was a convert to the faith and I was on fire for the faith at that point. Um, and you know, had, had embraced it. And so, so we got married. Um, and this was in 94, you know, in 1994, we got married. Um, and, um, after she finished school, we, um, packed up our bags and moved to Montrose, Colorado. <laughs> hey, I know that place. <laughs> And that's where, you know, Pete and Connie come into the picture. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I was working in the mortgage industry. Um, I've been in the mortgage industry my, my whole life after college. Um, and uh, my wife was a school psychologist. Uh, the reason we moved to Montrose is we, she was raised in Northern Nevada and um, she was going to school in DC. I was obviously as well. And um, we really didn't want to live in, in a big city like that. Uh, we were ready for a change and, um, wanted to move out West and, and Colorado would just seem like a beautiful state. Um, and we, she sent, uh, applications all over the state to get a job as a school psychologist. And she got it in the Montrose school district. Nice. Uh, so that's how, how we ended up on in that, in, in the small, beautiful, small town. Okay. So, um, 
and, and we moved, moved there and uh, was, you know, s- served in the, the um, LDS church uh, there. Um, uh, my wife worked and um, uh, met Pete and Connie and, um, you know, became very, very good friends with them. We lived there for about two years. Uh, this, uh, so we, we got married um, in 94. Um, we moved there in 95. So it was very quick. Mm-hmm. Um, we lived there till 97. And in 1997, we kind of decided that uh, we loved Montrose, but it was too small. Um, so we wanted to move back east. So we came back uh, and moved to North Carolina um, and Greensboro. That's where we live now. Um, uh, and uh, 1999, I, during this time in, in the LDS church, all of your, your leadership positions, at least on the local level, are all voluntary. Hmm. Um, so your each congregation has uh, the head of the congregation is what's called a bishop. Um, and the bishop has two counselors, um, and uh, they serve as the the local leadership for the local congregation. Um, and then all those each of those wards or congregations um, uh, report up to what's called a stake president. And the stake president would be like the equivalent of what a, a bishop is in the Catholic Church. The stake president right. is over multiple congregations. Okay. Um, so while in um, you know th- during that time, I started serving um, in some of the uh, leadership positions um, in, in, the, in, the, in the congregation. I, w- I was called as a second counselor in the bishopric. Um, I served in, on the stake high council, which is where it, it, the, the, the stake president has a council, which works with him to kind of help him uh, with uh, managing all of the um, wards uh, that are there um, within his uh, purview. And so I, I had several different um, uh, leadership positions in, in, the, in the congregation, but things started changing for me pretty dramatically in hmm. uh, around 2001. Um, after we'd moved back to Greensboro, we got, uh, like everybody um, in that time frame, we were getting internet uh, for the first mm-hmm. time. Um, and uh, I, at that point, I was in my early 30s. And if you, um, I was just the kind of person I always have been that if you tell me not to read something, I'm probably going to go look at it. I'm probably going to go, <laughs> going to, going to go read it. Yeah, I can relate to that. Um, so the, uh, um, the LDS church at that time was, was struggling with what they call anti-Mormon material, um, which was all these publications were, were coming out, um, different evangelical preachers, uh, different, uh, apologists, we're publishing information about the LDS church. Um, why, you know, why it is not true. Um, well, they, they, they were the, the LDS leadership, uh, the prophet and his counselors and the apostles and whatnot were saying, you know, to stay away from anti-Mormon material because it will, oh. uh, it, it's not good. It's full of lies. Mm-hmm. So I just, I remember this distinctly. I we, was, I was at home and, and I was like, what is this anti-Mormon material they're talking about? You know, I had, mm-hmm. I fully believed what the church was telling us, but I was like, you know, I'm just going to kind of, if it's not true, I'm going to see what, see what it is and, you know, kind of help to preach against it, so to speak. So I started um, doing uh, some, some reading, um, started going on the internet and researching some things. Um, and my life really started to change pretty dramatically at that point. Um, our second child had, but was born in 2001. Um, and I encountered some, some things about the, some teachings that, that the church was giving us that were, were not accurate. Some things that would to do with their history, uh, theological errors, um, to kind of give you an example, you know, what, one of the biggies for me, um, I don't know if you know, kind of the story of how the LDS church started. Yeah, um, a little, a little to... bit. I mean, between some of the early years of Joseph Smith, and then he has these visions, golden tablets. But you, you could give us probably a more comprehensive run through. Yeah, the, the way the story goes, uh, Joseph Smith um, was 14 years old, lived in Palmyra, New York, and was um, during this time. It was um, in, in the year 1820, mm-hmm. uh, and there was a revival going on. Um, yeah. You know, in in that area. Um, and there were multiple churches that were vying for membership and they were preaching, you know, you need to come to our church. You got the Baptist church, the Presbyterian church, so on and so forth. And as a 14 year old, he was confused about which church to join. 
So he went into a grove of trees one day. Um, after, well, let me back up. He was reading the Bible one, one day and came, came across James chapter 1, verse 5, which says, you know, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. So Joseph Smith said that his, uh, when reading this, he realized, I, I want wisdom. I, I need to go ask God which church I should join. So he's, mm. he tells the story that he goes out into the woods one day um, and finds a, a, a grove uh, um, and kneels down and says a prayer. Mm-hmm. And when he says the prayer, um, his tongue was tied where he could not could not speak and that he had two personages appear to him. Oh, okay. And one one pointed to the other and said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. So it was... God the Father appeared to him and told him to listen to Jesus Christ. And that Jesus Christ proceeded to tell him that all the churches that were on the earth at that time were uh, false. They were uh, Mm. uh, teaching error, um, that they drew close to God with their mouth, but in their hearts they were far from God. Mm. And that Joseph Smith was not to join any of the churches, um, that all of them were wrong, and that God was going to call him to serve as a prophet uh, to restore uh, the true church on hmm. on the earth. And, and that's so, the doctrine uh, of the great apostasy, right? Right. That's okay. the, the first vision, you know, where Joseph Smith is called. Um, three years goes by uh, where uh, Joseph Smith is visited by an angel um, and is told, um, that he, you know, is, is where these plates are, that he's supposed to go and, and get the plates. Three years later, he gets the plates, um, digs them out. They, they are the, they're, they're, it's the Book of Mormon. What it is, is, is what it was supposed to be. They were written on gold plates, and it was the uh, uh, activities, basically, of uh, written by uh, people, inhabitants of the Americas, mm-hmm. um, from the year, uh, 600 AD to about 400, i sorry, 600 BC to about 400 AD. Um, and it tells of there, 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 there was a group of people who had left, um, uh, uh the, the old world and had, had sailed here in 600 mm-hmm. BC and they had, um, uh, they were of Jewish origin, you know, mm-hmm. they, 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 they came here and they were the descent, they, they were the ancestors of the American Indians or the, the, okay. the um, so, um, anyway, it, 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 so that's how the book of Mormon came about was, mm-hmm. uh, from, from after the first vision and after the angel Moroni I visited Joseph Smith. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's kind of the story that, that is shared, um, you know, from, from, from the LDS, uh, church. But in my research, what I realized is that that story is actually, um, only one of, one of several uh, first vision accounts. That story was actually mm. not written until 1838, I believe is the year. Oh, okay. Uh, that so that, that version changed. of the first vision. Oh, yeah. There were multiple accounts that Joseph Smith, again, this this vis- first vision supposedly happened in 1820. Mm-hmm. The Book of Mormon was published in 1830. Mm-hmm. That's when the LDS church was officially started was in 1830. The first vision account that's, that, that is shared by the LDS church, the most popular one was, was written, not written until 1838. Okay. It was 18 years later. During that 18 years, Joseph Smith had shared multiple first vision accounts. Some of them, he, he states that only one being visited him, hmm. not two. Um, that's pretty important. Right. Uh, in, some of the vis- in, in some of the first vision accounts, he actually doesn't say anything about being called as a prophet and restoring a church. He only shares the account that the, 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 there was an angel that visited him and that the angel told him his sins were forgiven. Hmm. Nothing about starting a church. So when you read all these different first vision accounts and you're like, okay, well, wait a minute. The whole yeah. truthfulness of the LDS church hinges upon this being factual. Like mm-hmm. two, two personages uh, both have a body of flesh and bone because that's key to LDS theology. Um, and that all the other churches were an apostasy, that mm-hmm. there was no true church on the face of the earth. Um, you know, from the time, rough, roughly around the time of the death of the last apostle, of the 12 apostles, up until for, until Joseph Smith restores the church, the true church, the church is supposedly absent from the face of the earth. Wow. But if the first vision account is only one, one angel appearing to him, telling him the sins are forgiven, 
you know, what's true. So right. how also, do they you know, square that away? I mean, is there, I'm sure there's some sort of consorted effort to have apologetics to defend that and say, Oh no, maybe the account is not trustworthy. Like what, what typical answers were you hearing or did you hear? <laughs> At that point, um, you know, because again, this was around, this is in the early 2000s, um, LDS apologetics was really kind of just getting going for the most part. Um, and, you know, I, I started, because there were several other things that I came across, which were a problem for me. Um, I'll share one of them real quick, and then I'll kind of mm-hmm. answer your yeah, question, yeah. is um, that the, the way the, the Book of Mormon was translated um, if you look, you can just Google it, you know, LDS art, and you can find uh, uh, the typical uh, um, artistic rendering of Joseph Smith translating the Book of Mormon, because, you know, obviously he, he claims it was written in Reformed Egyptian, and that he translated it, obviously, into English. Hmm. Um, and so, it, it, and, and it, most of this art, art shows him, you know, with a can next to a candle, you know, uh, uh, s- 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 with just looking at this book that's that's metal plates, gold plates, um, and you know he's just deep in thought, and he's you know uh, uh, translating it the way you would think it, they typically translate. Well, mm-hmm. come to find out, one of the ways he actually did it was through what's called a seer stone, because <laughs> Joseph Smith oh, was yeah, he- was pretty heavily this. involved in he was pretty heavily ho- involved in the occult. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he was a a, uh, a treasure hunter, um, and so he he liked to go out and try and try and find buried treasure. Um, which was actually illegal at that point, hmm. um, you know, in, in upstate New York at, at that time. Uh, so, but he had this stone, which he, he said, you know, kind of gave him, you know, he, he could see things with it. So what he would do is he would take the stone, have the tablet sitting on the table next to him. He would take the stone, put it in a hat and put his head in the hat and cover, cover his face so that you know, it was completely dark. And then he said the words... That, that were the next word to be translated would appear on the stone. And he had a scribe, you know, uh, he, he, he would recite the word to, and then he would mm-hmm. move on to the next word. And the next word would appear on this stone. Interesting. So, you know, it, it, it was just kind of crazy because I was reading this stuff. And then you, you go and you, you look in, in the actual LDS information in you know, Joseph Smith history and in the writings of, of the early followers of Mormonism, those who follow Joseph Smith. And it's, that's actually true. That's one of the ways that mm-hmm. he translated the book of Mormon. And to me that, that just sounded like this is kind of very occultish. Like it's really yeah. weird. Um, and the, the LDS church actually still has that seer stone. They, they actually have it in their archives. Oh really? So they, they fully own up to it now. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, at that point, it was if you told somebody in a local in the in your local congregation, if you went to them and said, "Hey, did you know that Joseph Smith translated this using a seer stone?" They, you, you were kind of shunned in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. It was like, "Where are you? Where are you getting that information? You're reading anti-Mormon material. You shouldn't be doing that." Mm-hmm. Um, so to answer your question, you know, how like when I started coming across these things, how did I deal with them? I dealt with it very badly. <laughs> I mean, very, very badly. Um, my wife. Um, like I said, she was raised LDS. Um, it's the religion that she knew, um, uh, when we got married, you know, she married an, an LDS man and mm-hmm. she was looking to raise her children in the LDS church. She was very faithful. Uh, uh my wife, uh, has had at, at that point and has today, you know, a, a, a very deep faith. Um, she, uh, so when I was coming home saying, Hey, look at what I found. I found this mm-hmm. and I found this. And, and at, the, at this time, I also started really diving into the Bible. Um, I really sat down and started, was like, wait a minute, you know, this, this whole LDS thing might not be true. I started reading the Bible with what I, the way I like to describe this with my Mormon glasses off, let me mm-hmm. go through and just kind of start reading things, you know, and I came across things like, um, Isaiah chapter 43, uh, fat 44, there's multiple verses in, in Isaiah, which talk about, I am the Lord, the savior. Um, and there is no other, um, there is no God besides me. Um, Isaiah 40 talks about God creating the heavens and the earth. See how he stretches out the heavens like a curtain, just these beautiful verses that 
it just talks about, okay, there, there's no other God, but me. And, um, you know, there's no other savior. Um, and it, all of these things really kind of started to go against my LDS faith hmm. because in, in, in Mormonism, there is this concept, uh, which is taught and it's not taught as heavily today, but it, it was very prominent at that, that time that, you know, God is an exalted man, that he was a man who progressed to become God. And that, you know, when you are married, uh, in the Mormon church, you're married for all time and eternity in the temple and that the husband and wife are given promises that they can, um, grow to become gods of their own, uh, uh, priests and priestesses, gods and goddesses of their own world. Hmm. And so there is this concept of a infinite regression of gods. Now, you know, that God, God, that, uh, our God hmm. is the God of this world, but that, that he was a man who, who on another, another world grew to become like God and that he has mm -hmm. a God. Mm -hmm. um, and the way you see this, when you go into, in the LDS church, when you go into the temple to be sealed um, uh, to, your, to, your, to, your, to your spouse and you go in the temple, you walk in this room, which has a mirror on one side and a mirror on the other side. And what they will typically have you do is you'll look into the mirror and they'll talk about how you, you have this infinite reflection of, all, all the way back. You know, that mm. you can just see infinitely in the past and you can see infinitely into the future. And the way they describe this is it is is that's like humanity. That's like mm. that's that's like um the regression of gods that that you know we 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 has has always been and will always be into the future. So I say that this this is a an understanding in the LDS faith because it's not necessarily what I would say dogma. There are those okay. who will teach a little bit differently today. Um, they've kind of started moving more and more away from this understanding. And mm. you will see, have some LDS theologians today who will uh, talk about how there is one God and that they, there's multiple gods beneath them, but there is one um, eternal God. Gotcha. Um, because, it, because some of the, some of the faith is not, the, it's not as dogmatic. There's, um, sure. sometimes it's like trying to nail jello to a wall. <laughs> <laughs> to get somebody to, to stick to something. Right. Um, because there's multiple ways of understanding it, but it's mm -hmm. definitely in the faith. Joseph Smith clearly right. taught it. Brigham Young clearly taught it, uh, that, mm -hmm. that, um, God progressed to become God. And, um, yeah, didn't he you know, use, there are well, I don't know if it was Brigham Young or Joseph Smith, but they used, I think a St. Ignatius quote that gets misattributed oh, yeah. in Mormonism all the time. The one about, you know, um, like, uh, oh, I forget what the quote is off the top of my head now, but it's something along the lines. Like if you use it out of context, it could sound like it's supportive of that doctrine. But it's oh yeah, yeah. When you dive into um, L L LDS, LDS apologists love to mine the church early church fathers. They love using Saint Athanasius, uh, which says that uh, Jesus Christ became man so that man can become God, or God became man so that that's man can become God. That's what it is. That's God. yeah. So okay, yeah. that's the quote yeah. I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, how I encountered that what because. You know, what I went through at this time in, in between 2001 and 2008, ultimately when we left the church, the LDS church, um, I went through uh, times of really, really heavily questioning and saying I wanted out. I started attending a Baptist church on my own without my, you know, without my wife because she wasn't up for that. I would go to the Mormon church for their meeting and then I would go to the Baptist church for their meeting. And the reason I went to the Baptist church is because it, it was all I knew. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what I, I grew up. Um, you know, uh, around. So it was all I, all I knew, but um, it caused a lot of problems in our, in our marriage. Um, me kind of going in and out and, and questioning things. Um, and, you know, because, yeah, because understandably, because it was, it was rocking my, my wife's whole world. Right. Um, and, you know, we even had, we even had some who were close to her um, in the LDS church who told her to leave me. You know, that, that oh, uh, wow. I, since I was questioning the church, I should get it, it, that she should leave me. Um, mm. and, and it was really, really hard. So I went and talked to a lot of different people. I talked to my mm -hmm. bishop. I talked to those in the, some people in the state presidency. I started re I, I went and, and started reading some information at farms. Farms at that point was part of BYU, Brigham Young University. But it was like basically an apologetics wing. Um, and they would try to counter a lot of these things that you would, you would mm -hmm. encounter the multiple first visions. They would try to make them, 
uh, um, mesh, you know, more or less like, well, you know, he might have only been talking about one being at this point, but it's because he wasn't diving into the whole story. You know, he was sharing mm -hmm. who he was sharing it with. It wasn't the right time to share that there were multiple beings. Um, but ultimately, a lot of it just it, it it didn't settle right with me because I'm I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, well, if, if in 1820, if God appeared to me and Jesus Christ appeared to me and basically told me that everybody else was wrong and that you know he, he, he first of all, you're, you're learning right there that the Trinity is not true and right. that God has a body, you know, God the Father has a body, <laughs> yeah, um, and that He's an exalted man. Um, you know, I'm going to kind of, that story's going to stick in my brain. I'm going to know. And, and when I share it, mm -hmm. you know, it might not be word for word exactly the same from one person to another, but I'm not going to go and tell one person it was an angel and tell another person that it was, um, uh, uh, I was told my sins are forgiven and then tell mm -hmm. a third person that no, two beings appeared to me. Um, right. And there's a lot of other stuff that, that it would be way too long for your podcast to, you know, to kind of go into, but, um, uh, mm. that, that, that kind of rock, but so what ended up happening, um, uh, is, uh, around 2005, um, I had kind of reached a breaking point with it all where I was just like, okay, this, I can't figure this out. The harder I push, um, the, the more my wife is becoming entrenched in her position which again is, is understandable. Um, she, you know, be, because of the way she was raised and what she was taught, I, I totally get it. Um, mm. and I didn't want to break my family up. Um, mm. so, uh, but at the same time, you know, I didn't feel like I didn't believe that the church was true. Um, and seeing your kids taught some pretty horrible things in, in, in my mind at that point, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're not theologically true. Um, uh, for example, you know, singing, you know, a hymn praising Joseph Smith, then I'm like, okay, this is just not, not right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I went on a walk and I, I just remember this. I remember this very clearly to this day where, um, I just kind of broke down in tears on the walk and was just praying. And essentially I just said, God, you know, if, if you want me and my family to stay in the Mormon church, if it is true, um, I'll stay, you know, and, and, uh, you know, just, just work it out, help me to, to, to come to faith in it, to believe in it. But if it's not true, it's go, you're going to have to be the one to get us out because the more I try to maneuver and, you know, talk and, 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 and explain and, um, convert, uh, the worse things are getting, um, and, uh, I just don't, I don't think that you want our family broken up. Um, and so I'm going to kind of keep my mouth shut. <laughs> so I, I, I'm like, I'm just kind of, you know, I'm going to kind of pull in and I'm just going to go with the flow. I'm going to go to church and just keep my mouth shut and stop trying to push things. And so that's what I did. Um, our, we, we'd had our, our, our third child in, in 2004. Um, and with all three of our kids, we had to have help. Um, infertility. Uh, looking back, you know, thanks be to God, we didn't have to do anything that the, 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 the church today, the Catholic church would consider wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, thanks be to God, we didn't, we didn't go any of those routes, but we did have to have some help. Um, and we weren't, we weren't planning on having any more kids. We were done. So I came home from work one day and my wife tells me, um, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, okay, wow. You know, this is <laughs> awesome. You know, I mean, it was a shock, uh, but it was very, very unexpected. Um, and so about a month later, uh, her, you know, Brett, part of being pregnant is, is, you know, you're aware, you are you're a, you're a husband mm -hmm. and you have children. Mm -hmm. Um, your wife's breasts start firming up. Mm -hmm. Well, as her breasts started firming up, it pushed a lump to the surface and, mm -hmm. uh, she was, you know, just putting on lotion one day and felt something and was like, okay, my, I need to have this checked out. Mm -hmm. She goes in for a biopsy and she has breast cancer. Oh no. Um, and so our lives just completely got turned upside down. Yeah. Um, you know, she, uh, uh, the, the story ends well, I'll go ahead and kind of tell that, you know, she's still live here today and, um, our son is healthy today, you know, yeah, uh, Micah, um, praise God. Yes. So, uh, it all turns out well, but, uh, it, she had to go through, she had, 
had some tests done. She had the BRCA1 gene mutation, so she's very susceptible to, you know, uh, cancer reoccurring. Mm -hmm. But she had to go through chemotherapy um, while she was pregnant. Uh, thanks be to God, the, the chemotherapy they that they gave her did not pierce the uterine wall, so um, it didn't have any effect on Micah. Um, and uh, uh, he, was, he was born healthy. She ended up having a, a double mastectomy um, and had reconstruction done. Um, but what happened in all of this is what was the miracle. Um, and that was that, again, I had kept my mouth shut. And, mm. and after the cancer coming along, obviously, I really kept my mouth shut about that, uh, about everything, because it wasn't the time to, to start mm. talking about that. But what ended up happening was there was a couple of ladies who came into my wife's life. Um, the LDS church is very, very good. You know, they would, um, they, 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 they serve their own very, mm. very well. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying, I don't say that as like, I don't mean their own as in a bad thing. I just mean they do, they take sure. care of one another. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the relief society was, they were cooking meals, dropping them off. Um, but one of the things that didn't happen, um, is, you know, people just kind of coming by and say, Hey, let me put my arm around you. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, how are you doing? Let's talk. Um, but there was two ladies who, one, one who lived up just right up the road who put their arms around my wife and just became really good friends with her. Um, and, uh, after, you know, the, my wife had gone through all the surgeries and everything in 2006, she was, um, you know, Michael was born, um, and, uh, she was, she was healthy. Um, these ladies had entered into her life and, um, one of them started a Bible study. Um, she was a, a Protestant lady. Um, and her husband was a, a pastor. Hmm. Um, and um, she started a Bible study, and she invited my wife. It was a Beth Moore Bible study. Okay. And um, so, yeah, you're probably familiar with that. Yeah, um, I was going to say, she, my evangelical days. I remember Beth Moore. Yeah, I think she's Anglican now. I think Beth Moore is she? Is I was oh, thinking. wow. I think she is. I think she is. I could be wrong. Hmm. But um, so what the miracle of miracles was, my wife said, okay, I'll go. And she, she came to me and said, I'm going to go to this Bible study at Karen's house. And I was like, what? You're like, because, whoa. <laughs> it, I mean, yeah. it, for, 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 an, for an LDS at this time, for somebody in the LDS church to, to go to a Bible study mm -hmm. that, or, or any kind of study that is not part of their church was really, really unheard of. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, they're, they'll, they'll talk to you about their faith, but they're not, they're not necessarily going to talk to you about your, your faith. And so right. um, it was stepping out, way stepping out of my wife's comfort zone. And so she started going to this um, in, in uh, 2006, early 2007. And uh, she was coming home. The, the study was talking about uh, the Trinity. It was talking about the, the, the deity of Christ. And okay, some good she's coming stuff. Home with, yeah. Oh, yeah. She's coming home with, that, with all these questions about, about things that I had been reading on. Because, again, mm -hmm. I, was, I was spending a lot of time reading the Bible myself um, and had come to believe fully in, in the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, and she just started asking me all these questions. So it generated some wonderful conversations for her and I mm -hmm. without me opening my mouth first. It was me There's shutting up and letting prayer, God yeah. do the work. <laughs> um, it's funny how that works. And, yeah. I mean, it, it is, I was, I was too hard headed if I'd have done it, you know, five years sooner, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, so basically she, she came home after, at the end of this and just said, I think we need to leave the Mormon church. I don't think it's true. Wow. Uh, and I was like, uh, okay, <laughs> really? Wow. All right, let's go. Yeah. Um, and it was 100% not me. It, it was 100% God. Um, and I mean, I just broke down in tears. We both cried together. Um, uh, it, 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 was, it was just, uh, it was a miracle. And, you know, people to this day, you know, we, we have LDS, you know, family and friends. And sometimes people, you know, will, will think it's me that did it. Um, but if you know, my wife, uh, I'm not gonna be able to talk her into doing something that she doesn't want to do. You know, it's, <laughs> it's gonna, gonna come from her. She has, mm -hmm. she's very sharp. She's, uh, uh, has a strong faith and has a sharp mind. So she's, you know, it, it, it was 100% God working on her. Wow. Um, and it sounds like at that point so, you had, you had kind of 
at least internally moved on for quite a while, but obviously externally you were probably, were you still going to the services with them and stuff? Yeah. I mean, I, I was, and mm -hmm. I was just trying not to, you know, to be involved as little as I could, you know, right. but I wanted to keep the peace in the home. I would right. say from 2005 until we left the church officially in 2008, wow. you know, I was just trying to keep the peace at home. Uh, the last year or so, you know, was, and, and obviously while she was going through cancer treatments and stuff, mm -hmm. our church attendance wasn't what it would normally have been. Sure. Um, you know, and so uh, there was some relief there and in that, that sense mm -hmm. of not just not being, not being able to go, not, not, um, but right. yeah, I mean, it was, well, it that's, was me keeping my mouth shut. That's tough too. Cause I mean, it sounds like your initial sort of doubts with, with Mormonism started, you said as early as like what, 2001. One, yeah. So that's that's almost eight full years of like going to a place that you don't believe is the true church, and that's that's a long road. And then to have your wife, you know, in her own path and her own way, come to the same conclusion, yeah, that must have been a huge sigh of relief. I mean, you must have felt like what? <laughs> that's just wow. Oh yeah, I mean, it was it. it... It was a very trying time. I mean, for, for both of us, for her, because I was questioning things and for me, because um, I didn't believe, but, you know, I was try, trying to be supportive, trying to be a father, a good father and a good husband. Mm -hmm. um, the whole time, you know, when you, when you hear your kids being taught, you know, we thank the old God for a prophet talking about Joseph Smith mm -hmm. um, and they're singing this mm -hmm. and then they're getting up on um, you know, on, on uh, fast and testimony and they're saying, I know the church is true. I know Joseph mm -hmm. Smith is a prophet of God. And you're like, you're three years old or four years old. Right. You don't know that you're just being, you're just reciting what your parents have told you to recite. And I'm talking about my kids, mm -hmm. you know, did, doing stuff like that. It was, it was, yeah, it, it, it was no fun, but I think God through, through that all, what God was teaching me is that it, it, it's, it's not you. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's the whole, it's the Holy spirit that converts. It is not, uh, faith is, is a gift. It's, right. it's a gift. Um, and Satan can blind your eyes. But I, I did, when we first left the LDS church, I had a lot of anger. I will admit, mm. I mean, uh, the first couple of years, I, was, yeah. I, you know, I, I was, I spent a lot of time online, a lot of time arguing with Mormons. And I, I have since repented and said, I'm sorry for some <laughs> of the things that I said. Sure. Um, but I was not the nicest person. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, online, I was letting some of my frustration out, um, on, uh, Mormon apologists and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, so, uh, it, did you at any point in that sort of ongoing deconversion over um, yeah eight years, did you at any point, I mean, it seems like you held on to faith in God in some capacity. Was there ever a point where you were wondering, like, is any of this true? Like, is it, is there just no God? Nope. I mean, I, I would say that, that, um, and, and I've, I've asked myself why that is, because like I said, during my college years, it wasn't that I was an atheist. I would never say I was an atheist. I, I would say I was more of an agnostic. I was probably a practical atheist because the way I lived my life right. was as if God didn't exist. Sure. But I, I but I was not, um, n never you know, what I've described myself as an atheist. Mm -hmm. But no, I, I, when I was ready, when we were, when I started reading the Bible, I, I came to you know, over that seven years, sitting down and, and reading the scriptures for myself and, and, and researching and coming to understand the doctrine of the Trinity and, and other things, um, I, I always maintained my faith in Christ. I, oh, I just wow. came to see that who Christ is, that Christ is the second person of the Holy Trinity. He is one in nature with the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's mm -hmm. not my older brother, my older spirit brother, the way that the LDS Church teaches, because the LDS understanding of God is completely different, completely yeah. different. Um, you know, we're yeah. all spirit children and, and Christ is the oldest born spirit child in the pre-mortal world. We're all sent to the earth, uh, to, to earth to get a body. Um, you know, there's no creation ex nihilo. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's multiple things um, that, yeah. that, are, that are dramatically different. It's really interesting. I, it's, I think, I can't remember if we talked about this before, but I, I had a couple of missionaries come over and I kind of brought that up because I was like, if there's this eternal regression my question was like, what about the God of God? Like, should we worship him? And they said like, at some point his answer literally was, well, at some point it's so far away, it doesn't matter. And I was like, wait, we're talking about a being that is ontologically worthy of worship. Right. So we should ascribe worship to it. And then I said, at some That's point, the if, key. yeah, if some point Joseph Smith is a God, then wouldn't he be worth worthy of adoration in the same sense? Oh, and yeah. he kind of was yeah. puzzled. He was kind of like, 
I guess so, but like we're not supposed to do that technically in that way, right? Um, but it, it just like it, it, it logically doesn't make sense, and I, I brought that up, and they didn't really have an answer. But if you think about it, it, it what it strikes me as is, and I'm, I'm hoping this doesn't come across as uncharitable, but the the ontology of godhood in Mormonism feels similar, more similar to like ancient Near Eastern paganism, where there's like deities that are limited in a sense, and they're embodied, and they can have children, and oh, yeah. who like there's no real understanding of how far back it goes, you know, or like Hinduism or something, you know, or or even like Greek mythology where like Zeus comes down and gets a little rowdy, and someone gets pregnant, and that person's a demigod now, you know. Um, I've always thought that was interesting. I mean, that's I wonder how that formed right because if he's if joseph smith is reading the scriptures and having the second great awakening kind of form him you would have thought maybe he would have held on to some of those things but to lose some of the foundational things like you would you know if he would have held on to, he would have converted more people maybe i I don't know that's just my i guess weird practical thought but no i mean you're 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 kind of hitting the nail on the head with some of the things that i was struggling with during that time and as after coming out of the church became even clearer to me Mm -hmm. um and that's why I brought up some of those verses in Isaiah, like late Isaiah, you know, 40, 40, 40, 40 mm-hmm. 43, 44, over and over and over and over again. He says, you know, I am the God there. I am your God. There is no other. There is no right. God before me. There will be no God right. after me. Um, and then, you know, the, this whole thing of how he, you know, spreads out you know, creation and, and, and all of, they're like crickets mm-hmm. and you know, creation is like crickets. And it's just, it's this understanding of the greatness of God. Hmm. Um, but in, in Mormonism, there's no ontological separation between God and man. And they pride themselves mm. on that and, 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 and that being what they proclaim is the truth. And they, you know, they call the ontological divide that we believe in, in traditional Christianity, you know, they, they say it's a heresy. You know, right. they, and I'm like, but it, it's clear in Scripture. There's no right. God before me. There's no God after me. But the way that they'll explain it is that what that's referring to is the God of this world. And, and my response, as I thought about that more and more, I was like, no, there's only one God of this world, and that's Satan. Ooh. <laughs> I mean, no, no. I mean, and yeah. <laughs> I'm, not saying, I'm not saying they're worshiping Satan. What, what right, I mean right. is, is when you say that, it's like, no, the God of this world is, is – is, that's, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a reference <laughs> that's to Satan. the devil. Oh, man. And, you know, I mean, it, you, you, you know, it can't be that, like, the God that I worship is only the God of this world, and there's a God right. before him and a God before him and a God before him. It, it's just, it, 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 no, no, that's not what I read. When I read scripture, I don't, that's not what it's preaching. It, yeah, what it's and, preaching is that God is the supreme. He right. is he's the one. I am. Yeah, his ways are above all else, higher than any man can comprehend, all that. Like, there's all those verses that, like, really, a lot of those defining verses of God's character and God's essence in the Old Covenant, or in the Old Testament, are, are like, precursors to, like, what Aquinas takes and formulates, right? I mean, I think of, like, the argument mm. for hierarchical causation, not necessarily linear causation, that, like, there's just a chain reaction, but even hierarchical causation, that in order for something to have the potency to cause existence, it has to be you know, the, the unmoved mover, it has to be hierarchically right. something that preexisted, like what we would know, like call as, you know, the universe. And it has to be, it has to be God, right? Otherwise, hierarchically, you have an issue of causation. And if you don't have a, de- yeah. like a hierarchical ground, then you kind of have a eternal regressive problem, you know? Um, right. Wow. Well, and and it's, that, it's, it's very, very interesting because the LDS church does not, they don't teach creation ex nihilo. They teach that matter in its, in its basic form has always existed. Matter is eternal. Oh, um, like Joseph eternalism. Smith in the scriptures. Interesting. Yeah. In, in their scriptures, you know, in the Doctrine and Covenants and stuff, it's called intelligences. And I believe, actually, I believe it's in the Pearl of Great Price. But hmm. they have four scriptures, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, Book of Mormon, and then the Protestant Bible, the King James Version, the, hmm. the, not, not, not the Catholic Bible, the Protestant Bible. Interesting. Um, but uh, in, in, I believe it's Pearl of Great Price, it's described as intelligence. It's, it's, like, hmm. it's like the most basic matter. So even when we were spirit born in the, in the pre-mortal life, it's really that we were formed somehow out of these intelligences to become spirits. Interesting. Um, but matter is just as eternal as God. And, and in reality, if, if you believe that the God that we worship is the God of this world and that he had a father who was a God of another world, um, then really the the matter is more eternal than than the god of this world is because he wasn't always god he progressed wow. to become god but matter has always existed 
So it's, it's a very different understanding of worship and a very different understanding of who God is because it's, it's not, it's not the, the, the God of traditional Christianity. It's not. Mm. Yeah. And then there's weird things too. And we don't have to touch on this too much. I kind of want to move on to your, the rest of your story, but there's weird things I've learned about even recently of like Brigham Young was really convinced of the Adam God doctrine. Do you know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about? Adam the Adam God doctrine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That Adam was God, the father, right? That's basically what it was. Which then, then yeah, but Adam's he, the one that he, sins. I, I don't get that. Yeah, it it the, the LDS Church has clearly they, they that's one thing they have clearly said. We do not believe that. Yeah, they have they come out and said that. that that's right, not. Right. But but there is a there is a speech that Brigham Young gave where he said that Adam is the god of this world. That, oh, that, interesting. And 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 it and it developed into what's called the Adam God doctrine or the Adam God theory that somehow if God the Father had become incarnate in Adam. And um, it, it, it was preached for a little while. Um, and the problem with that is not that, not, I mean, because, you know, people can teach incorrect things. I mean, you can have people get up even in the pulpit of the Catholic Church and they can say things, you know, from the pulpit that they're not necessarily, right. you know, they're not, they're not inerrant, you know, um, mm-hmm. they're not infallible. Um, but he was a prophet when he right. taught this. And it's like, wait a minute, you got the prophet of the LDS Church. The prophet, seer, and revelator from the pulpit teaching a doctrine that now you're saying that was completely wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, again, it, it, that was one of the things that I was like, wait a minute. So how can I trust what the, what the prophet's saying today is accurate if mm-hmm. I can't trust that what he taught back then was accurate? And he had people believing it. You mm-hmm. can see it in some of their diaries and stuff where they went mm-hmm. home and wrote about how Brigham Young taught this and, mm-hmm. you know, and they're trying to understand it and whatnot. So. It, but it does kind of fall in line with this whole progression of God's thing too. It does. Sure. It kind of fits with some of these things that Joseph Smith was preaching, and mm-hmm. the King Follett discourse and stuff. So, hmm. what do you? So, uh, real quick, just before we, we go on to the next phase. I mean, at this point, you guys have kind of transitioned out of Mormonism and all that. But uh, uh, now, where you're at now, what do you think actually happened? Like when you look back and you think about, okay, Joseph Smith in the woods. Do you think he just made it up? Do you think he saw something that was leading him astray? Like, what do you think actually was going on there? Well, I mean, the only thing I can say definitively is it was not God. Um, sure. You know, I mean, I can 100% say that. Um, I think that Joseph Smith was a genius. I think he was very, very gifted. Um, there's his, I believe it's in his mother's diaries. She tells stories about how, you know, Again, this is long before TV, long before any of the technology that we have today. People, they would they would sit around at home by a fire and tell stories. To right? Yeah. He 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 read the Bible backwards and forwards. He he knew he knew Scripture very very well um, from from a Protestant uh, Protestant understanding. Um, and his mother says that he he used to tell stories like he would he would weave these stories about the American Indians being descendants of, of the Hebrews and, 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 uh, you hmm. know, Jewish descent and that he, he could, he could enthrall his family with, with stories. And this is, you know, at the age of 12 to hmm. 11, 12, 13. So I think he was a genius. I think he was extremely charismatic. Um, personally, I mean, I, I lean towards that. He had, did have some type of spiritual experience. He was, like hmm. I said, he was somewhat involved in a little bit of the occult. I mean, not the occult in the sense of like we think of it today, like he wasn't right. one seeing mediums and trying to, sure. you know, um, uh, but, but, you know, with this whole seer stone, with the whole treasure hunting, using mm-hmm. a divining rod and, and things like that, it was, it's obvious that he was involved in some stuff. Mm-hmm. So he may have had a spiritual experience that he then just, you know, used so, in some way and um, what he weaved it to into uh, ultimately, I mean, it headed down a, a horrible path with uh, polygamy and, you know, he married a, uh, coerced a man into 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 him marrying one of his daughters. I, I believe she was fourteen at oh, the wow. time he married her. Um, and you know, it, 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 he had multiple multiple wives. He, mm-hmm. he in one of his revelations, he says that uh, it's in the Doctrine and Covenants where he says that this is that when he was bringing polygamy out. His wife Emma, his first wife, was not cool with it. I mean, she just she she was she was not on board with it. Yeah, and, and makes Joseph sense. Smith, he had a, <laughs> He had a revelation in it that he that that where God was commanding Emma that she she must you know allow it that she must hmm. be okay with it and that if she didn't she would be cursed I mean that then Emma Emma would be punished for wow. that and so you know here he's handing a, a a 
revelation from God to his wife saying, you've got to let me take multiple wives. And so what it kind of turned into, um, you know, there, there seemed to be some, some things in there that are more uh, uh, to satisfy himself than necessarily, you know, for, for God. Um, so uh, I, and I personally believe that, that there is some uh, um, evil, evil, evil behind all, all of it. Hmm. Um, I, you know, whether or not he actually had a vision and, 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 you know, I, I couldn't say, I mean, I think it's, it's entirely possible that, that he had some type of vision, but it wasn't what he proclaimed it to be. Hmm. So I'll kind of leave it at that because anything sure. else I'm just guessing. Sure. Um, yeah. You know. Well, that's, that's, and we still got, we, we still got family that are actively involved in the faith. So, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. you know, on my, on my wife's side. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, I mean, that's, that's already an incredible journey. So, I mean, you, you grew up nominally Baptist, became a practicing LDS member for quite some time. I mean, you were, you were active for a while, had a deconversion, um, 2008, I think is where you'd left off. You guys officially mm-hmm. exited the church. Okay. What, ha- what happened after that? Well, what we, my, my wife and I, when we sat down and talked and we went to lunch and said, okay, where are we going to go to church? You know, because we, we, both believe in Christ. We both both believe in God, but you know we know this isn't true. And um, I said, "Well, the only thing I really have a background in is the Baptist Church, and there's this nice little Baptist Church that's not very far from our home. So why don't we go check it out?" So, um, interestingly enough, our kids have been going to we school there. You know, hmm. we're um, you know, the, uh, um, and so we had a little bit of connection at that church. So we you know we knew a couple of people, um, and we had a. Um, so we, we started going there on, on a Sunday as a Southern Baptist church um, here close to our house and um, loved it. Met some wonderful people there. Um, I was very interested in apologetics at that time. And I got to know a, a gentleman there who um, was attending Southern Evangelical Seminary. Okay. Yeah. And so he uh, took me to an apologetics conference one weekend and I just, I fell in love. I saw Peter Kreeft for the first time. Oh, wow. um, at that conference. Yeah. And, um, you just fell in love with, with, with apologetics. So I started taking classes at Southern evangelical, um, hmm. and, uh, you know, started learning a, a little bit of, you know, Christian philosophy, started doing some, some heavy reading in, into some of that. And, uh, I started teaching Sunday school with some friends. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we were, we were very happy, uh, for, for that time. I was writing on an apologetics blog um, uh, called Tough Questions Answered. It's toughquestionsanswered.org. Um, and you can actually go there and find some of my stuff that I've written on because a, a lot oh, of no my way. writings were on my deconversion from L- the LDS faith. That makes sense, um, yeah. And, and Billy Pratt runs it. And he's, he's, he's a great writer, very intelligent man. Um, and so he's, he's the primary author on it. Um, so I... Uh, so... <laughs> That's when like another phase started. Mm-hmm. I had one of the things I, I was very, very heavily into apologetics, but I had never read anything, you know, from the first 1600 years of the church, um, mm. uh, uh, you know, other than the Bible and coming to understand the Trinity, um, mm-hmm. knew very, very little of the history of Christianity still. So uh, I went to a local, um, there's a Greek Orthodox church in our town, which has uh, a, a um, every year uh, they have a, a big a big bake sale. They have the Greek Greek festival, and they'll have mm-hmm. all kinds of food, singing, dancing. They give a tour of the church, and I, I wanted to go there to get some of the food. So I was yeah. like, hey, you know, a friend and a friend, a friend and I were like, hey, let's let's stop by. So we stopped by to, to get some food, and the priest was giving a tour of the church, and I was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to go on this tour. I've never seen the inside of this church. I wonder what it's like. So I um, went on this tour, and all I can say is that when I walked into the church uh, for the first time, it was like I hit, I was hit with the Holy Spirit. Um, it, it was just the beauty of the iconography just staggered me. Um, you know, I, I, I felt like I knew God, you know, like I, I, I believed in God. I had a relationship with God. I, but, but, but encountering that beauty and that particular moment, I was just, it took my breath away. Um, 
And so I just started talking to the priest, asking all kinds of questions. He probably thought I was weird because, you know, <laughs> other people were just kind of going on the church. They were going, going on the tour. And I started asking questions like, what's that? What's this? What's this? And so they started, hand, you know, they, they were giving out all kinds of pamphlets on the Orthodox faith. So mm-hmm. I went home with a stack of pamphlets, you know, let's see if I can find the camera, like this thick. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, my, my wife, I, I walked in and I was like, honey, because she didn't go, she, she, she didn't go. I went with a friend. Mm-hmm. She didn't go on this with me. I came home and I was like, honey, have, you got to see this Orthodox church. And she's like, what? What are you talking about? And she's like, we just left the Mormon faith like three <laughs> years ago. Like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm not saying we're going to become Orthodox. I'm just saying this was incredible. It's beautiful. Yeah. So I ordered, I ordered, I was just like, it's beautiful. So I ordered just tons and tons of books. I ordered, you know, the Orthodox Church um, uh, by by uh, Metropolitan Police to Swear. Oh, I've read that. Um, it's a great I, book. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's a great, great book. Um, and so I started ordering stuff on the Orthodox faith to try and understand, well, what is this? And I found a local Orthodox church um, here in the triad in North Carolina that did everything in English. Because the one thing about oh, that nice. Greek Orthodox church is everything was in Greek. <laughs> 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 so I was like, I was like, yeah, I mean, it really, and like you go to the service, it's all in Greek. So I was mm-hmm. like, okay. I, but we, I found one, it was OCA, Orthodox Church of America. Mm-hmm. And I called up the priest, um, you know, just called it and said, hey, do you allow visitors? And he's like, yeah, you know, welcome to come by here. So I, we, my wife and I started attending uh, Vesper, their Vesper service mm-hmm. on, on Saturday evening, not with the intention of converting. I just wanted to understand what it was all about. Uh, we were, so we would go to Vespers on Saturday night. And, and worship with them. And then we would go to our Baptist church and teach Sunday school and, mm. and, and, and attend uh, church on Sunday. Um, so this was in uh, 2010, around 2010, 2011 is kind of when we started doing this. So it was a couple of years after leaving the LDS church. Mm-hmm. So as I started uh, reading, I ordered the Anti-Nicene Fathers. Um, and this is probably was, was probably what, what did it for me was this book right here, Anti-Nicene Fathers. Um, I ordered that and I started just reading, you know, the teachings of the church from the first hundred years directly mm-hmm. from their mouths, you know, St. Ignatius, St. Irenaeus, uh, St. Justin the Martyr. Mm-hmm. Um, and after I finished reading that, I was like, there's something wrong here. Um, yep. the, the uh, you know, where, where the bishop is, there is the church, mm-hmm. um, the understanding of the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as I started diving deeper and deeper and deeper into that, I was like, wait a minute, this is not just a symbol. They didn't believe it was just a symbol. Right. Um, there's something more to this. And, um, I started kind of having those, those wheels turning in, in my heart. And in my mind, and, uh, and we started attending more and more of the, we started occasionally going to divine liturgy, um, on Sunday mornings, we would go like one week, we would go to the Orthodox church. And the next week we would go back to the Baptist church. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the nail, there was two nails that, that put that, that, that made us ultimately decide to leave the Baptist church was, and, and the, Both of them, the main one is really the Eucharist. Um, I was sitting in the Baptist church that we were going to, they, they celebrated the Lord's supper on Wednesday nights and, um, or actually they would occasionally do it on Wednesday nights. Sometimes they do it on Sunday nights, but this particular time was on a Sunday night. So I went to church with the intentions, the intention of taking the Lord's supper. And as I'm sitting there, um, the, the pastor at the front of the church, you know, pulls everything out. And as he's saying the blessing. As, as part of the blessing, he did it, he, he, he did it, you know, off the cuff. That wasn't a rote prayer. As part of the blessing of the Lord's Supper, he actually said, this is not the body and blood of Christ. It is merely a symbol. Hmm. And when he said that, like, I, I, I'm sitting in the pew and I, and I just full stop. I just went, I can't take this. Like what he just said, I can't partake. I'm like, that's a problem. Like, it, it, it doesn't fit. It, it, it doesn't fit. We're, we're, mm-hmm. He's teaching something which is foreign to the first 1600 years of the church. Um, and I was like, I've got a problem. I'm like, I'm not in the place I'm supposed to be. Um, and then the second nail was we were, we were on, on, in church on a Sunday and a, 
um, they had a missionary family who had come back from Russia. They had been serving as missionaries in Russia. And she, as part of their talk, they talked about how they had gone into these churches in Russia to try and convert these people who were, you know, uh, um, not followers of Christ, that they were downtrodden, that they were, you know, uh, worshiping pictures of Christ and worshiping statues and, and, and everything. And I'm like, she's talking about a Russian Orthodox church. And, you know, she doesn't understand their theology. And I, I literally got up and walked out of church uh, because I was like, I can't listen to this. Like mm. she's, you know, everybody in the congregation is kind of shaking their head like, yeah, you're right. They don't, they don't believe in Jesus. They need Jesus. We got to take, got to take the Baptist faith to them. And I'm like, wait a minute, they're following Christ. They're part of the, they're, they're, they're Orthodox. Mm. Um, and so we just decided, you know what, it, 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 we've got to go where the spirit is leading us. And so my wife and I were very, very united on this. The, it was not, uh, a me leading, you know, it was, we were both attending and we both kind of came to see that, you know, the, the Eucharist is key. Hmm. I mean, that, that, that for me, we sat down and had a conversation, uh, my wife and I uh, about, okay, if, if, if the Eucharist is supposed, if, if, if it is something you're supposed to partake of weekly, it is central to your, sir, to, to your worship. Um, and it is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. The real presence mm -hmm. of Christ is there then that really rules out a lot of options. Right. Um, There's about two left. You know, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. Two and a half. I mean, because yeah. you still have like the Anglicans, you know, the sure. Anglicans have yeah. some understanding of it there, but, mm -hmm. but the Anglicans for us were out because there are some pretty liberal social teachings were happening in a lot yep. of them. And, um, and I told, I remember I was telling my wife that I was like, well, the Catholic church can't be true. I mean, they got that whole Pope thing and I can't as being raised Baptist, you know, I mean, my, my understanding of the Pope was like, uh, you know, no, I'm, I was raised Baptist. No, 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 no. It can't, yeah. can't, it's gotta be orthodoxy because it can't, they, they can't, the Pope can't be true. So my wife was like, okay, yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. And we sat and we talked about it. We talked to our priest about it and we went through, um, a conversion, uh, the conversion process in the Orthodox church. We were chrismated, um, in 2012. Uh, we were chrismated into the church. Um, our youngest, uh, Micah, had not been baptized yet. Um, he was baptized and chrismated. Oh, wow. Our other three kids were, um, they were uh, uh, chrismated as well because they had all mm -hmm. been baptized in the Baptist church. Um, and so they were chrismated and we, our whole family became Orthodox. Oh, wow. Um, beautiful service. Um, loved it. Uh, was a wonderful small um, Orthodox Church of America uh, church. We had wonderful friends there. Um, and we just got heavily involved. I mean, once again, my wife and I just kind of jumped in with both feet, getting heavily involved in the church. Um, and uh, it, it, it was a shock uh, for us. We uh, weren't planning on doing that. Um, but it, 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 it was kind of like baby steps because, you know, coming out of the Mormon church, if we'd have tried to go from Mormonism to orthodoxy, there That's is a lot, no yeah. way. No way. <laughs> That's I mean, a big step. Like. Well, and, and God understands like where my heart was and my, and my brain was and where my wife's heart and my wife's brain was, there was just no way we could do that. Um, uh, accepting the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, I mean, versus Mormonism, who, which is so, um, uh, uh, again, they believe Christ, they believe God the Father has a, bo mm -hmm. has a body of flesh and bone because the concept of this being who can go anywhere and do anything and, and it can be in all places at once just makes no sense. It's got to have flesh and bone. They're, they're very like realistic, like what is realistic. Mm -hmm. And so to go from that, that brain to somehow Christ is present in the symbols of bread and wine, and flesh are partaking of wine, which Mormons won't do. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I had so. th some missionaries one time message me on Facebook. Every once in a while, they try to engage with me, and then they stop talking to me very quickly. I don't, <laughs> but uh, they wanted to come to mass, and they one of their first questions was like, "What the elements of the sacrament was?" I was like, "Oh, bread and wine." They're like, "Oh, well, we can't take it because it's wine." I'm like, "Well, that's one reason, but you also can't take it because you're not Catholic." But yeah, it was, uh, I forgot <laughs> that that they like don't drink at all. So that was kind of yeah. a laugh. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. What a yeah. What a change. I mean, you know, it's the whole time you were 
talking about that part of the journey, all I could think about though is it's just like God. It's and and how God is so good to us to to know that okay, we'll let you guys rest here for a little bit. You're gonna have good community. You're really getting into scripture, which is what you had been reading for eight years just on your own, and now you have a community around that. But then to slowly lead that into this encounter that like, okay, there's more in a way that it doesn't sound like at least it was as disruptive or like earth shattering this time. Right. It seems like at least from what you're telling no, me, it was just kind of this natural all. progression from bat being a Baptist to Orthodox. Yeah. I mean, leaving the, the, the LDS church was a traumatic experience mm -hmm. and, and we lost all, pretty much all our friends, um, you know, and uh, um, kind of had to completely start over. Uh, and, and it was also a complete shift in, in the way you think, um, because you go from this idea of a, um, the church, God's power, God's church being not on the earth for, uh, you know, essentially 1800 years uh, to, to this understanding, you know, of, nope, it's always been here in some form. Right. Um, we're not going to, we're not going to talk about the first 1600 years, but it's been here in some form. <laughs> um, right. And, you know, but no, it, that, that was like, that, that was life altering and mm. to the utmost. Um, mm. But to go from the Baptist church to the Orthodox church, we, we still have friends who, who, I mean, I talk to them all the time, um, who are part of the Protestant community and, um, you know, we play golf together, we do things together. So, um, nobody really disowned us when, when we, when we left there, but, you know, it was, it, but it was a beautiful experience. Like I, that. It was like our, our minds and our hearts were being opened up to this mm. fullness of the faith mm. from the, 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 the earliest times, you know, this concept of holy tradition, which, you know, you see in Second Thessalonians, you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, and this understanding of, of uh, tradition, you know, being that which is handed on, mm. and it can be both verbal and, and, and written down. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that, that there is a correct way of interpreting scripture. You know, you start to see the faults with sola scriptura, um, that it's, it's really a self-defeating doctrine. I mean, it ultimately is, it's, it's a self-defeating understanding. Um, because if, if sola scriptura is true, you've got, you, you've got to be able to find it somewhere in the Bible where the Bible says that, that, that this doctrine, but it's doesn't exist in the Bible, no matter how you try and turn some of these verses around, they uh, to twist them. They don't support sola scriptura. And ultimately you need uh, tradition uh, to help give that the guardrails for how you interpret scripture. Um, you know, otherwise you end up with multiple understandings and you end up going against mm -hmm. things that were consistently taught for 1600 years, Right. you know, for, for the first 1600 years of the church. So um, being opened up to all of that was just beautiful. Um, and I, we, we don't, the, the liturgy, you know, the Eastern liturgy, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom is a beautiful liturgy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, worshiping God in that manner, uh, was something completely new to us. And, and we loved it. I mean, it was strange at first, but once we came to understand what was really going on, uh, and you start, start seeing the beauty in it. Um, it, it, it we loved it. Wow. That's amazing. I, yeah. It's, it is so different too to come from like a non liturgical religion into one that's like very liturgical. What was that like in your experience? Cause I know for me, that was like coming from like low church evangelical rock shows into Anglican, Anglican, then, <laughs> then Catholicism. Yeah. It was really, really good for me, but it was also a challenge. So like, I mean, obviously the beauty draws you in and stuff, but just practically, what was your guys' experience like that with, with that? Well, <laughs> The first time we attended liturgy, divine liturgy, this is while we were still Baptist. It was, you know, before we ever decided we were, I, I got my wife to come to, to liturgy. And when we, when, when we walked out, she said, I can never go back there again. That incense is destroying me. <laughs> She's like, I cannot stand the incense. Oh no. And the Orthodox is a lot of incense. Yeah. Oh, the, the, you, you multiply what, uh, T t take a Latin mass and multiply it times 10. And that's yeah, the amount of incense see, that we were yeah. dealing with <laughs> because it was a small room. I mean, th this Orthodox church was, it was very small. Um, and it, it <laughs> and it was packed and, you know, they incense like four or five times, you know, they go around and they come out of the iconostasis mm -hmm. and go all the way around. And they're incensing the, incensing the people like five, four or five times. <laughs> it's good. And so it was just, every, the room was filled with it. 
and I loved it. I was like, oh, this is beautiful. Yeah, My wife so is good. like, she's holding her nose, she's holding her nose like this <laughs> and kind of going to the back and like, going oh. to the, and, um, but then again, God, because like one, the, we went, she did go back and once she, that, that was the only time the incense negatively affected her. Once we mm. went back, she was like, this is actually beautiful. I love she it. She built up a tolerance um, to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And I mean, but I mean, I personally never had a problem with, with the liturgy because the mm -hmm. way I came to understand it was that we're all liturgical creatures. I mean, mm -hmm. even if you take a Baptist church, it's typically going to be something along the lines of you come in, you sing, you have an opening prayer, you sing one song, mm -hmm. then, you know, you have the offering and then you have the, the, the preaching and then you have two songs, you have, a, and then, and then you have a closing prayer and then you have another song. You know, there's some type of, Every church you attend has a basic liturgical format. It mm -hmm. just might be, you know, different. But right. you know, they'll they'll in certain certain different songs. But you know, they're going to do two songs here and one there. Um, mm. And and you start thinking about us as as human beings. We're very liturgical creatures. Right. So I, I didn't have I didn't necessarily have a problem with that. The the thing that I did struggle with a little bit at first was some of the the, the prayers like. Hmm. like it, reading prayers rather than prayers just being, you know, off the cuff, um, you know, with, with you know, me being able to, uh, not that Orthodox or Catholics don't believe that we can pray that way. Cause I do all the time, you know, I'll sit down and just say a prayer all the time. And I, and I did then and I do today, but you also have some prayers that are just the prayers that have been handed down in the church that, that we will pray. Um, and that was a little different for me. Um, you know, I, I would say that, that that was one of the things that I struggled with kind of adapting to is like I yeah, got to concentrate sense. and make make this prayer mine. Right. Know, make, make this prayer I'm reading mine. Which is the right way to do it because like even as Catholics and even Orthodox don't believe that you should just be saying it without meaning it. Like the intention is right. that, you, that you fully mean yeah. what you're saying. So that that's the right way to do it. I, I got to say, I love the, uh, the Eastern rite of the church. Um, I, I, when I was looking into it, I, I would have much preferred to be Orthodox, but you know, same thing that, that darn Pope, you know, um, that would have been much more comfortable for my evangelical background as well. And I loved the liturgy. I still do. I mean, in the Jesus prayer, um, that's a big devotion for me. So, uh, it's good. It's good for the church to breathe with both lungs. Uh, I went to my first Melkite liturgy just like six months ago. So it was Eastern oh, Catholic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Eastern yeah. Catholic, but basically Antiochian, as far as I'm aware, like very similar liturgy. And, uh, yeah, it was awesome. And no kidding. The incense was just like, it was beautiful and just, clouds. you couldn't see anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I loved it. So, yeah. Yeah. I, wow. I, know, I know what you mean. I mean, I, so. so how long, so, yeah, so, so we got Orthodox in 2012 and yep. then how long were you Orthodox for? And then what kind of started to shift there? Seven years, okay. um, we were Orthodox, and you know, and, and dur during that time, I, I actually um, started attending Antiochian House of Studies. Um, I got on the deacon track. I started uh, uh, um, serving um, in the. I became uh, what's called a subdeacon. I was ordained a subdeacon in, in the Orthodox Church, so I was uh, serving at the altar, helping to run the liturgy. Oh, cool. um, You know, ser serving with the deacon, and I, I was on the deacon track. That was kind of the, you know where I was headed. Um, I was helping teach classes and stuff there. Uh, loved, loved the Orthodox Church. Um, so what what happened was um, <laughs> uh, once again God's not, not done was not done with us. Yeah. Um, it wasn't something we planned on, but in in 2016, what, one of the things that's that's let me back up. One of the things that's going on with orth Orthodoxy in America, they're in a non canonical situation. Mm -hmm. um, and they will admit this, um, that, that if you, it, just in our town alone, we've got a Greek Orthodox church. Uh, we've got a Russian Orthodox church, you know, not, not very far. We've got a Greek Orthodox church and we've got two others. I forget which ones they are, which, um, but we got basically five just in the triad here. Um, and that they all have different bishops. Uh, we would, uh, one of the oh, things wow. that we would do in our, in my OCA church that I was a part of, Orthodox Church of America is uh, we did everything in English, but whenever one of the church, one of our the other churches in the area was having their feast day, we would a lot of us would go go to their church and celebrate their liturgy with them on their feast day. And uh, the Greek Orthodox Church is the Dormition. It's it's a uh, um, uh, 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 Dormition 
of the Theotokos, uh, Mm -hmm. so the following sleep of the mother of God. And um, I would go over there and uh, it always shocked me because I would walk in and they wouldn't know who I was. And I was almost every single time I walked in the church, I was asked by somebody if I was Greek. And I said, no, I'm American. And they're like, you're American, but you're Orthodox? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm Orthodox. I attend the OCA church over in High Point. And they're like, OCA, what's that? And I said, it's the Orthodox Church of America. It's the American you know, jurisdiction of, of, of the Orthodox Church. And they're like, American Orthodox? You know, and they just like had this puzzled look on their face. They had no clue. Um, and so it became pretty, pretty clear that, that or, Orthodoxy is, is fairly nationalistic. Mm-hmm. Um, that their churches are divided on national lines. And so they, this council was supposed to happen in 2016. It was called mm-hmm. the Great and Holy Council. It had been, been planned for about 100 years in the making. And one, one of the things that this church, that this council was supposed to do was deal with the non-economical situation in America Mm -hmm. to try and get all of America somehow, uh, organized where, you know, there, there's, there's one line of authority, you know, Mm -hmm. somehow, some way, um, rather than having, you know, multiple jurisdictions, multiple bishops over, over multiple, um, uh, different dioceses. So it fell apart, um, in, before before the council even happened, the, the council d- did happen, but there was multiple churches that did not attend the council because the beginnings of what is now happening with Ukraine and you know with Russia and Ukraine, it all kind of started back then, uh, where the uh, the church in Constantinople recognized um, uh, autocephaly for the a church in Ukraine, or they started recognizing the church, a church in Ukraine. I forget the, 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 the real details of all of it, but basically Russia did not like what the church, uh, uh, what the uh, patriarch Bartholomew did. And so they got into a big fight and multiple bishops, church, bishops from multiple churches refused to attend. Hmm. And basically the council became a all for nothing. You know, wow. nothing happened in America. And um, there was some other stuff that was happening in our in our local parish at this time. Mm-hmm. We were trying to we were having a building campaign, um, and th- there was really a vacuum of leadership and some of that. But what ended up happening was I started to see that well, how could this council be in the making for a hundred years, and these bishops just like refuse to go, right. and. I started asking questions like, well, how does that get solved? Like, is there one bishop who can say, hey, no, you need to. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, no, all, all these bishops are equal. They mm-hmm. consider themselves, they're all equal to one another. There's no, not one that has more power than another. Mm-hmm. So I started asking a lot of questions about that. And so then that's when I kind of started reading uh, from some of the early church fathers about the papacy, because I was trying to understand the concept of the papacy. And I picked up a book. Um, here it is right here. I'm going to show it. That um, it's, a, it's an Orthodox book. It's uh, by John Meindorf, um, and it's called The Primacy of Peter. Because one of the questions I started asking um, is, uh, Orthodox will say that the that, that the that the Bishop of Rome is the first among equals. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what does that mean? What does first among equals mean? That's what Orthodox will say, that that's the proper role of the Bishop of Rome. He's the first among equals. So what does that mean? And depending on who you ask, you're going to get a million different answers on what first among equals means. Some people will say it means that he can call a council. Some will say that it means that he, that, that cases can be appealed to him. Um, and some will say it's just a position of honor. It really means nothing. Well, in my readings of, uh, um, in this book, I came across some quotes from Alexander Schmemann, who was, you know, a pretty big theologian, um, in, in the Orthodox church. And I just started getting shocked at some of the things that, uh, he said. Um, and I'll just read one of them to you here, uh, just so you can kind of see what I'm getting at. He says, if the church is a universal organism, she must have at her head 
a universal bishop as the focus of her unity and the organ of supreme power. The idea, popular in orthodox apologetics, that the church can have no visible head because Christ is her invisible head is theological nonsense. Wow. That's written from an orthodox <laughs> theologian. Um, and I was like, what? <laughs> uh, okay. That doesn't sound like, you know, this idea of just a place of honor. Right. Um, it sounds like it involves a lot more than that. Um, hmm. You know, it, here's another quote. An age-long anti-Roman prejudice has led some Orthodox con con canonists simply to deny the exist of, exist existence of such primacy in the past or the need for it in the present. present. But an objective study of the canonical tradition cannot fail to establish beyond any doubt that, along with local centers of agreement or primacies, the church had also known a universal primacy. Wow. And, uh, I mean, he's basically saying in, in, his, in his essay here that, yeah, the church, that, that, that there is this idea that, that we have need of primacy. And I, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, seeing what happened in 2016 and now what's continuing to happen with, you know, the schism between uh, uh, Russia and the Greek church and the schism is probably not, I mean, logically, how is it going to be healed uh, right. without a, without a Pope? It, it's not likely to be healed in my lifetime. Hmm. Um, and so it, it just kind of started us down this road where we started asking a lot of questions. Um, I did some reading on uh, um, purgatory uh, mm -hmm. because I, 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 you know, the Orthodox churches says that they don't believe in purgatory, but in reality, in some form or fashion, they have to have to believe in it mm -hmm. because they believe that when you die, you know, that, that you're not perfect when you die, but then when you, you enter heaven, you will be, morally perfect. Mm -hmm. So something happens. Something happens right. from the time you die to the time you wake up in heaven. And they say prayers for the dead. I mean, when my, my mom passed away in 2015 and, um, you know, we said all kinds of prayers. We had some services in church for her. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she was not Orthodox, but, you know, she was, she was a Christian and we said all kinds of prayers for her and everything. And it, and it was very beautiful, but you start asking questions. Well, why are we saying these prayers? Right. If we don't, be if we believe that she's immediately in heaven. Right. So I started, you know, asking all those kinds of questions and what ended up happening one day, um, uh, we went, my wife was out of town. And so my kids were like, Hey, we want to go to the Catholic church just to kind of check it out. We'd never been. Um, and I was like, yeah, you know, I've been doing all this reading, um, on, uh, uh the Catholic church and kind of coming to realize the need for the Pope. Mm -hmm. Um, even though, like I said, looking back on it, I was always like, no, no, no. I just came to realize the need for this and came to see the things that the Pope did in the, 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 you know, early ecumenical councils, you know, the, the Tome of Leo, um, and, and other things, uh, uh um, the formula of, formula of Hermistus, um, and, uh, things in it. It just came, became clear to me that there was much more to it than, uh, um, orthodoxy was allowing. Uh, uh, as a role for the Pope. And we went to mass um, on a Sunday and my, my daughter had never been. Uh, mm. um, uh, she's, so we walk in there and the organ starts playing and our, our local church here is called um, Our Lady of Grace. And they've got an absolutely beautiful organ, gigantic organ. Um, and the organ started playing and my daughter's eyes just lit up. And she looked over at me and she's like, that is beautiful. Cause she'd never heard anything like it. Hmm. And, um, and, and I was like, yeah, that, that really is, you know, that, that for all the, the, the beauty that orthodoxy has, Catholicism has just as much beauty. It's just, it might be a little bit different. You know, hmm. it's, it's, it's a, it's a Western, Western expression of that beauty rather than an Eastern expression. Um, so we started kind of doing the same thing that we we did when we were uh, um, making our way into the Orthodox Church. We started attending um, mass occasionally to kind of you know get our feet wet in it. Um, and there's several things that we really came to appreciate um, in Catholicism. Um, the first one is the 
how do I put this? I came to feel like when I was Orthodox and I was asking questions that there was this anti-intellectual bent. Hmm. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very understated, but you know, you, you have, uh, uh, Ortho, one of the there, there's there's this idea of this mystical theology in orthodoxy, which is true. I mean, there is true. There is a mystical understanding. You know, the the sacraments are are mysteries, um, and but it was almost like this this fear of 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 asking too many questions that that you know that you don't want to get scholastic about it, and you know they and right. they, they and they're anti scholastic, and I never really kind of fully agreed with that because I was like you know. God, Christ tells us, worship the Lord your God with all your mind, mm -hmm. with all your heart, and with all your soul. Mind is included in there. So there's nothing wrong with asking questions and pursuing that understanding. So um, I came to really appreciate that in, in Catholicism. The other thing is uh, the, the ease of, of services. I, I love the, the – we always we, – we did love the um, – the, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. But the, the liturgy in the, in the Eastern church is because they are, they are divided into jurisdictions. The, the ability to get, go in and, and make the liturgy something that can be celebrated regularly, like with ease during the week, it, it, they, they just have no organizational way of doing that. Um, but I came to see this thing called daily mass, which I was like, the, the Eucharist is our daily bread. I mean, it, it's, it, it is the, the um, you know, in the Lord's prayer, uh, give us this day our daily bread, our super essential, super essential mm -hmm. bread. You know, the fathers yeah. of the church interpreted that to be the Eucharist. Yep. And the fact that, that, that the Catholic church has, has taken the liturgy and get, given it as something that we can go to every mm -hmm. single day. So like our, our church has, has mass at 7 a.m., you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, and it has it on Saturday at 8 a.m. Hmm. Um, and I, I came to see this as like, wow, this is something that can become part of my life on a regular basis because mm -hmm. the church is organized and structured in a way that they've been able to take the mass and, and condense it into its most essential form mm -hmm. and give it to us in a, in a way that we can go to it and celebrate it daily. And so I fell in love with that. Also, the ease of going to confession. One of the things that I struggled with in Orthodoxy was, at least in our, our parish, um, if you wanted to go to confession, you had to schedule a time with the priest. And it was a very lengthy affair, you know. Um, and so, you know, when I was ever I was struggling with something in my life that I felt like I needed to get to confession uh, about, um, it, it, it was just, it was difficult <laughs> to get in there. In the Catholic church, you know, it's just, it's readily available. It's right there. I mean, I just, I, I, we have confessions every day of the week. You know, there's a time nice. and I can go, I don't have to schedule a time. I can just go in and do it. Now, all those things might sound minor, but they are part of the sacramental life. Uh, that, that, that the sacramental life becomes part of something every single day that, that you that you can partake of, that you can somehow enter into that grace. I also came to really appreciate this understanding where uh, of sins in mortal sins versus venial sins. Orthodoxy does not, does not delineate anything. It, mm -hmm. it, it really doesn't. So it's kind of, and that's one of the reasons, you know, some of the things that they've changed, like they've changed um, their understanding of contraception. Um, and divorces, you know, where divorce is, is something that's permitted up to, you can have up to three marriages in the Orthodox church. Um, it, it, it's not looked at the way that the, 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 the Catholic church has always looked at it. Um, and, and, and the, the idea of, of a clear delineation between venial sins and mortal sins, it's something that, that in, in our, in our hearts and in our minds can, can give us peace where we can, this understanding that I'm walking in, you know, uh, uh, sanctifying grace. Not right. that I'm presuming my salvation. I don't mean to take it right. that far, but, but there's not as much question 
about it. Uh, there, you, you feel like you're safely in the arms of the church in some ways. Right. Um, so I've kind of droned on and on, but, but there's multiple things about it. But the, 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 the big thing for us was coming to understand the need for the papacy hmm. and the benefits that we have, even, even when you've got a bad pope, um, you know, in the past, the church has had bad popes in the past, um, you know, but there's still this understanding of the, 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 the papacy, the pope being the locus of unity, the visible head, mm-hmm. and, and how we have a way to, to deal with situations. We have a structure that can deal with situations that when you lack that visible head, you cannot deal with those situations. And that's one of the reasons that orthodoxy is in the mm-hmm. state it's in today is because they have, I hate to use the word, but um, a, they have a broken ecclesiology. Hmm. Um, uh, that's the way I describe it, is that there's just, that without this visible head, there's there's a brokenness there. They're lacking something. And right. so would love to see it, it, it unified. Well, and you saw that in very practical terms, right? Like it's easy to get caught in the weeds of like reading the fathers and going, Oh, was that just an honorific title? Or was that really some, you know, primacy of honor with some weight to it? But to see, you know, I think it's like, that was, is that the pan Orthodox synod in 2016? That's kind of what they call it now that it ended up not being a council. Or is that it, it was the called the great, it, it, the it's, great they did have it. it they, it's oh, okay. called the great and holy council. Mm-hmm. Um, but it ended but up, like it, it wouldn't it, be ecumenical, really wasn't great. <laughs> right? It wouldn't be like the weight yeah. of an ecumenical council in their book. Right. I don't think. Not yet. I Not mean, yet. we'll see if it, I mean, because the, the bishops weren't, there were so many bishops that weren't, that there. weren't there. So yeah, I don't see sense. how, and, and, the, and they don't have a way of determining what is ecumenical and what isn't. Yeah, it's only that's time that thing. determines that for them because they don't have a Pope to sign off on it. Right. So that makes it so know, tough you, because it's so clear in like earlier histories that like after Nicaea, they were like, that has some weight to it. You know, there was um, right. some problems with implementation. Sure. Every council is going to have that, but to, to, you know, post schism, not have any effectively any ecumenical councils that anyone's agreed upon. For me, that was very telling when I looked into it too. Even just practically, like all issues of like semantics of the first thousand years aside. Oh yeah. You know, like you get to the schism, and then after that, we haven't had a council. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> That's kinda... yeah. No, I mean, it, it, and it, and these things it, it plays itself out in the believer's right. life. Let me give I give you one example of how how it majorly plays itself out today. Um, if if somebody wants to become Orthodox, and let's say let's say they're a Catholic, they've never been Orthodox, they want to be or a Baptist, you know, they, they want, they want to become Orthodox. If they go to what's called the Russian Orthodox church out, outside of Russia, Rokor, um, if they go to a Rokor jurisdiction, and even if they've had a Trinitarian baptism, baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a Trinitarian church, Rokor is going to say, you have to be rebaptized. Oh, wow. They will not accept your baptism. Wow. However, however, if I go to that person goes to an OCA church, the OCA church will say will will investigate their baptism. If they determine it was a Trinitarian baptism, they will accept that Trinitarian baptism and allow that person to just be chrismated. Wow. And they'll receive them via chrismation. Mm-hmm. So you've got two different jurisdictions giving different answers about a sacrament. Something that the the, the Nicene Creed, the creed that we we recite that the Orthodox recite. I believe in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Right. They have a disagreement on a sacrament. To me, that is like that. That's that's huge because mm-hmm. I've known of people. I've known of people personally who were received into the OCA Church, who got interested in Ropor, started getting involved in some Ropor parishes, and the Ropor uh, priest was telling them they needed to be rebaptized. Oh wow. So even after they been- after they've been after they've been Orthodox wow. for ten years, I'm okay. like, what is going on here? I'm like, that's that's a that's and it's an ecclesiology that that is that there's right. some problems. It's like messy. That gets really messy. If, I mean, that's the that's the central central sacrament for how you received into the church baptism, mm-hmm. you know. And you're telling one's telling you your baptism's good, the other one's telling you it's not. Right. And and right. the same very same baptism. So, wow, that's anyway. Yeah, that's really messy. Um, I could see. So, I mean, I would have imagined that like it would be problematic, but someone would go in through OCA and then could go receive it Russian at a Russian 
like a real core church, but that you're saying that yeah. they had been in the OCA church for a decade. And then that's, yeah, that gets really messy. Um, and not not no saying that the real core church it really. Right. And I'm not saying that the real core church is going to demand that they be rebaptized. Right. That's not what sure. I'm saying. I mean, I'm just saying that like for somebody who's, who, who maybe is, is a little bit suffers from scrupulosity, that's going to be something that in their oh, mind yeah. they're going to be traumatic. like, yeah. well, wait a minute. They, they, they're they telling me I should have been received via baptism. I wasn't baptized. Um, maybe my baptism isn't valid. Maybe I'm not really orthodox. Mm-hmm. And and that, and you know that it's 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 a problem. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, it, it the, these things they have practical consequences in mm-hmm. in the believer's life mm-hmm. uh, that result from that that the 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 ecclesiology being you know ha- ha- suffering from some damage and, right. and suffering not having that visible head. Mm-hmm. So, wow, yeah, that's like that puts a whole new spin on it too. Because like I never I had never actually crossed the line into orthodoxy. I was really looking into it before I became Catholic, but to hear like the on the ground implications of some of those issues puts a whole, it puts a whole new weight to it, you know, of the importance of those things. Like they're not merely just semantic things for theologians to bicker about. Like those carry out real consequences. Um, so at this point you've, you've gone through all of those things with Catholicism. You're starting to look into the papacy and come to terms with mm-hmm. it. Uh, what was the final step? I mean, so you guys are received into the church at some point. Tell me about, tell me about that last, that last part. Yeah. I mean, we just, we, we started attending, you know, the, 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 the Catholic church fairly regularly. And, um, in 2018, uh, is, is kind of when we took that step and started really going there on a regular basis. Um, and, uh, uh, it, it, we just fell in love with it. I mean, my wife and I, you know, started, uh, um, occasionally going to daily mass mm. and, uh, the, and, and the priest there even allowed us before we became officially Catholic, I went to him, we, we met with the priest and told him, Hey, we're, we're discerning, you know, the Catholic church here trying to determine if this is where, where we, you know, where God is calling us and, um, you know, shared with them some of the concerns that we had mm-hmm. in, in our, or, or, you know, Orthodox life, you know, and, and, and why we were discerning it. And he completely understood. And I just asked him, I said, Hey, can, can I, can I partake of the Eucharist? And I said, I'm not Catholic yet, but you know, I, I realized that my Orthodox church, if I go back there, once I take the Eucharist here, if I go back there, it's, it's a big deal. I'm going to have to repent. But, um, you know, if we stay here long enough and, and, and I want to partake of the Eucharist or uh, um, I want need to go to confession, can I? And he said, absolutely. You can fully you can fully participate in the sacraments here in your current state. Mm-hmm. So I started going to confession there, um, you know, and uh, 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 loved it. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I love the, the, the way the Catholic, the Western church does confession mm-hmm. compared to the Eastern church for me. I love it. Um, yeah. and, and the ease of it, you know, just being able to just get up early in the morning and go in and before I go to work. Um, but it, it was really just through conversation, my wife and I, through attending there, we, we kind of fell in love with, with the Western, right. Um, mm. you know, we still, I still have some fond memories and the be- the beauty of, uh, the Eastern, um, uh, worship set, uh, liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. It is absolutely beautiful. I don't mean to dis- to besmirge it at all. It's absolutely beautiful, but there is a holy simplicity also um, to the mass mm-hmm. that that I love, mm-hmm. um, and the 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 fact that it is something that again I can go to daily mm-hmm. uh, is 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 a big deal. I mean, it, it's it's a big deal. My wife and I we don't go every single day. But, you know, she'll go a couple times during the week. I'll go a couple of mornings a week. Um, and, and we just love it. So what we, we ended up uh, over the course of about seven or eight months, you know, just kind of attending church there, we went and told the priest, we said, we, we feel like we want to make the switch. We want, we want to become fully Catholic. So uh, he brought our family in and he received us uh, via, via confession. Um, not, wow. not, 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 not confession of going in, into the confessional. I mean, mm-hmm through a profession of faith, right. you know, he, he'll, he'll hold a service for us, um, and had us, you know, recite the creed and, um, and received us. Mm-hmm. And that was in March of 2019, uh, that we did that. Hmm. And I've not regretted it and I've not questioned it once. I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I know people, people are going to listen to this and they're going to think these people are crazy. 
<laughs> and I totally get it. I totally get it. And I, I understand anybody who says that. Mm -hmm. um, I would probably be saying the same thing. All I can say is that it's been a journey, journey that has been guided 100% mm -hmm. by God. Mm -hmm. um, we are home and we are very happy. Even with all the difficulties we have in the Catholic Church, the thing that I point to and that I absolutely love is the fact that we have a catechism. We have dogma. Um, the, the, the fact is you might have people who claim to be Catholic, who are Catholic, but disagree with aspects of the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. But one thing you cannot say is that we can't clearly define what is and is not the teaching of the church. Right. It is extremely clear. Yeah. It's, um, what, yep. <laughs> what, what the church, what the church teaches. Um, and I, I take great, great comfort in that. I also take great comfort in the fact that I'm part of a church that, that has been united, um, you know, for 2000 years. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, I can point to the church fathers and we teach and believe, you know, what they believed on, on the Eucharist, on confession, on baptism, um, you know, infant baptism, you know, you name it. Um, we, we, we can, we, we, we have that, that uni unity in the faith. Um, and it's, but it's not something that I, I know myself and I know my wife enough to know that, uh, there's absolutely no way we would have been ready to receive the Catholic faith coming out of the Mormon church in 2008. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no way. God guided us, gave us just enough to where we could be like, all right, yeah, I can accept that. That is truth. And we could see it, but it was baby steps. It would be like taking, you know, um, Moses and, and, and transporting him to, you know, uh, uh, the first council of, um, in Acts, the first council of Jerusalem, <laughs> Moses would have been like, what? You mm -hmm. just told me like, I'm not allowed to, we're not supposed to do this. And now you're in the first council of Jerusalem. You're saying I, I can't eat right. pork. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just, it's baby steps. And, um, that, that's what it was for us. There was, there was, it was, it was baby steps mm -hmm. and God knew our hearts. Um, but we're very happy now. Um, you know, I teach RCIA or assist with teaching RCIA anyway. Um, so I'm heavily involved in teaching Sunday school uh, at our church. We have what's called Credo Cafe. So I assist in teaching that. My wife is uh, very involved um, uh, with uh, different service things at the church. And like I said, she's up, she's up there at the church almost every day of the week. Um, awesome. Our church is, church is oh, oh, Our Lady of Grace is an absolutely beautiful church. It's very traditional. We actually do have a Latin mass there um, mm -hmm. that, that they celebrate uh, and um, – we, we, we attend the um, Novus Ordo but, uh, and love it. Mm -hmm. uh, but our Novus Ordo is very, very reverent. And our priest is just, he's, he's a very holy man. So That's amazing. That's good yeah. to hear too, because that's the one thing I was going to ask about too, is, you know, Catholicism has clearly defined dogmas and it has a structure, but then on the ground, it can get a little weird sometimes. Like if you go to a parish that maybe doesn't have yeah. resources or whatever, but it sounds like you guys have a really vibrant local parish, which is huge. I mean, praise God to walk into that and find a place that has a reverent mass that has a holy priest. Um, Cause that can be the difference maker for sure. I mean, if it, if you walked into the wrong parish that maybe wasn't even doing what they were supposed to, which unfortunately happens, you know, sometimes people just happens, turn around yeah. and walk right out the door. Um, wow. I, I love that. Thanks for your story. I mean, I, what I love about it is what you said at the end. It's exactly what I was thinking the whole time is it's just this slow, it's, it's, I mean, God is a gentleman, right? He's like slowly holding your hand all the way home. Um, in there's difficult moments, there's ups and downs, but I mean, there really is like all these little slow segments in your story to, to coming all the way into the faith, uh, you know, starting from Mormonism into a more biblically rooted faith, then into a sacramental faith, then all the way home to, to union with the successor to Peter. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wow. it's like, it's almost like God, we, we, we received the word in the, in the scriptures, you know, at first, and then we were started receiving the word in the Eucharist and, yeah. and, um, wow. you know, it's just, it's God, God was, God was leading us there slowly. I, I'll, I'll share this one thing with you that you'll, you'll probably get a kick out of. We talked about Pete and Connie earlier. Yeah, I look, I often look back on, um, uh, our time in Montrose because one of the things that, that Pete tried to talk to me about when we lived there, and this was in 2006, 
mm-hmm. was uh, some of the some of the crazier teachings in Mormonism, which did not line up with his Catholic faith. He never did it in a way that was offensive, but you know how Pete is. He'll he'll yeah. he'll make comments and joke around with you. And he was like, "You ever read this King Follett discourse that Joseph Smith gave?" And and then <laughs> in 2006, I had no clue what he was talking about. And he started trying. He would he would just drop little things about the Catholic Church here and there. And in my 2006 brain, I thought Pete was crazy. I was like, he's reading this crazy stuff about Mormonism <laughs> that, that, that we don't teach that. We don't believe right. that. And he's talking about this Catholic faith, which can't be true. Mm-hmm. And now I kind of look back on it, you know, almost 20 years later. And I'm like, or no, 30, <laughs> almost 30 years later, because yeah. this was 96, almost 30 years later. Wow. And I'm like, that was a smart man. And God, God, <laughs> I think God planted them in our lives because once we became Orthodox, you know, we reconnected with them and, um, and Pete was like, "Oh, well, you're 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 close now. You're close now. You just got to take that next step." And and when I was Orthodox, I was like, "Pete, I'm not taking that next step. I'm not yeah, becoming no way, Catholic." Man. And then lo and behold, then lo and behold, you know, five six years later, hey, Pete, I'm Catholic, and he's like, "What?" <laughs> so that probably made him happy you know, when you told him you came all the way home. That's great. Well, it's just it's a it, God has a sense of humor, but like mm-hmm. I said, he he, he did. You know, it, it, thanks be to God, because it mm. wasn't anything that, that we could have done mm. um, on our own. It was a 100 percent him. Wow. That's yeah, that's incredible. I mean, that, that's how I feel, too. Even looking back at my story, there's all these little touch points where looking back on it, you're like, oh, wow, that's really funny. Like there's a lot of foreshadowing along the way. So in, in, in retrospect, it's a fun story to look back on people's journeys and stuff, because in hindsight, we can see how God moved, right? Like in hindsight, you can see like, oh, wow, Pete actually was spot on and had some good stuff to say. And now I'm in the same, you know, the same communion that he's in. Um, that's incredible. And then, yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, for you guys to just get plugged in like that and you're you're helping other people come in, um, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's been it, it, one of the things that I think God has has blessed. I mean, I can't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, but in terms of like the 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 teachings of the LDS Church and the, and understanding the difference between what the LDS Church believes and what we believe, and what say Calvinists believe versus what we believe, um, because I've made this this journey through the faith, I can teaching RCIA. I absolutely love it mm-hmm. because. We have people coming, you know, just in the last two, two years in working with the, in RCIA, we've had people coming who have backgrounds in Mormonism, mm-hmm. backgrounds in the Baptist church, wow. even had one person who has a background in orthodoxy oh, wow. who were kind of making their way into the end of the faith. And yeah. God has blessed, blessed my wife and I with the ability to understand where they are and kind of meet them where they are mm-hmm. uh, because of, of, of the experience of having lived through it. Um, and, you know, the ability to be able to uh, be guided by the Holy Spirit and talk to them in, in a way that's not condescending. It's just like, hey, right. I, I understand where you are and why you have these questions. And let me help you kind of mm-hmm. understand why we believe what we believe and, and the reasons for it. Um, and so, you know, there's, the, again, thanks be to God, there's some good that comes out of it mm-hmm. in that way. And hopefully God can use it to bless the lives of others. I can relate so much to what you said about not remembering what you had for breakfast, but remembering all this stuff. Like I, I feel like when I went on my deep dive with the church fathers and studying theology, I just like dumped long-term memory, fifth birthday gone, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something that St. Ignatius of Antioch said, boop. I can remember that though. It's so funny. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, it is, it is. It's, it's very funny. I mean, yeah. cause, and my wife will comment on that. She'll be like, how do you lie? I'm like, it's <laughs> Dude, not me, know. but you know, but then she'll, th- but yeah. then she'll bring up something. You remember what you said last month? No, nope, no I don't way. remember what I said. <laughs> what did I say? I'm, I'm the same way. Yeah, absolutely. I've just like dumped all of my personal knowledge for theological factoids, I guess, but, but it comes in handy, right? That's yeah. It comes in handy when you're doing that kind of work. So, and that's really cool. I mean, it honestly, that's the justification for that whole journey, right? Is now, now there's people from all these different walks of life that you get to help walk through that same journey. And you can, you can have those unique touch points with so many different people along that path. Um, wow. That's interesting too, that you're seeing that you're seeing more people come in from LDS, like orthodoxy, like makes sense to me in a way. Cause it's not that far of a jump. Right. And then like Protestantism makes sense because especially if you start studying history, you realize that that is your heritage and like there's one to one. Um, but are you seeing like, do you think there's like sort of a movement with LDS maybe? Cause I know that they're, they're seeing some people leave the church. I mean, people are leaving every church in that regard, but 
Are you? Do you think? They're yeah, I mean, to... the, the, yeah. I mean, I, the, the the what I've encountered in the last couple of years is is people who have a background in it. Like, there's one gentleman who um, came in, came into the church uh, this year who uh, was raised LDS, but he he left he left the LDS church spiritually, um, you know, years and years ago, and is kind of coming back into, you know, faith gotcha. in God, okay. faith in Christ, and, and yeah. has made his way into the, the Catholic church. Hmm. I mean, the LDS church is definitely struggling. Um, I mean, all churches are, yeah. but uh, it's, it's had a pretty, subs- the, the internet has had a substantial effect on their ability to uh, proselyte in the U.S. for sure. Hmm. Um, because, because of the availability of the information that I encountered, mm-hmm. you know, it's so readily available now that anybody can come across it. Now they are working very hard, obviously to, to counteract that with apologetics. Um, but it, 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 it mm-hmm. it's definitely had a, a detrimental effect on, on them. Um, yeah. and, you know, well, hopefully... and it's, it's made it tough for, I think any organized faith system, right? Because you know, all of your dirty laundry is getting aired, which in many ways is a good thing, right? Like even in Catholicism with our own yeah. scandals, but, and, and the way we responded, like was, was, has been good. It's like, Hey, if we're going to open it, let's open it all the way and get to the bottom of it. You know, uh, um, right. doesn't make it any worse that it happened. It's still horrific, but being able to face it that way is good. Um, I mean, yeah. what, one of the things that I've never encountered, though, I mean, and, and it may happen. I mean, don't, don't don't get me wrong. I've just personally never encountered, at least from a Catholic perspective, of let's try and whitewash what what happened. Right. You know, yeah. it's like, no, this happened. We did this. Here's why. We did that. Sorry. My, yeah. My, <laughs> yeah. yeah. My experience in the LDS church was very different because mm. for so long it was they they white they, they they just did not talk about it and they tried yeah. to hide it. I mean, that's what that was what. The whole "don't read anti-Mormon" material, mm. which was preached for so long, um, mm. was was that they just didn't want to. No, don't don't read that. Well, why mm. didn't you tell me that he had nine different versions of the first vision? Why right. does somebody else have to tell me that? Now you're trying to explain to me why he had these, right? And and you know, it's like it. it why didn't you just tell me right up front? You presented this to me, you know, as if it was the only one, and it wasn't, right? I think so, that's, a, you know, it, it, yeah. yeah, that's the thing that within Catholicism is like, it's in our favor. I would say like, uh, this is almost like existentially in our favor that, that since the church has been around for 2000 years and obviously has some very human blemishes that, you know, humans have done things uh, yeah. that humans do. Right. And yet yep. for us to have that doctrinal clarity and that, that consistency and even in the midst of, yeah, you look back at some of the bad popes who were like morally depraved, but they weren't going around like changing things or fundamentally altering doctrines. There's been this like, I mean, you look through history, there's almost, there's almost inarguably this protection over the essential components of what the church is in the midst of great the, human the, error. hundred percent agree. The fact yeah. that the church still exists today, <laughs> yeah. despite all of the uh, humanity, you know, it just shows that it's guided by because it, it one of the ways I explain it to I've tried to explain it to my kids is that you can see the power of God in the fact mm-hmm. that he's able to work through sinful human beings right. to bring to pass something that, that, that you know, that an organization, you know, uh, an organism, really, that's mm-hmm. been in existence for 2000 years, mm-hmm. despite, I mean, Let's just be honest. Sometimes you can just walk into the local parish and you can see the way things are run, and you're like, "How is it still in existence?" The way like, yeah, here? you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just it, because it's human sure. beings, but mm-hmm. but um, it, it 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 does, and you know, mm-hmm. God is able to work through all of our sinful sinfulness and all of our fallenness and and our imperfections, and still, you know, mm-hmm. grow, grow the church. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's amazing. It, it's it's amazing. I think it's comforting too, because I am a human being, so I'm often the one messing things up in the church, right? <laughs> Every once me, in a while, me yeah. too. <laughs> so, me too. <laughs> the fact that God knows how to deal with us is pretty good, and He's got a good track record on it. But I think what's interesting is like other communions will do what you described with the LDS Church. They'll try to whitewash it or cover it up, or they'll try to like purify, right? There's like that Puritan impulse almost in in human beings to like take the messy thing and hide it, or get rid of it, or cover it up, or cleanse it. And I think it's it's good that Catholicism doesn't do that or can't do that for very long when it's tried, because then it then it's comforting. Because like even if it's messy and it's hard to deal with sometimes, that the church is messy and that there's problems and there's people and people people are garbage sometimes and do garbage things. 
we still like as someone who is often that mess, I know that there's a place for me here. Whereas when it goes the other way, when it goes, let's hide that, let's cover that up. If there's a messy behavioral thing, let's just pretend it, you know, let's like get rid of those people or whatever. There's that sort of like rigorous mentality. Then it's like, well, who, who can be here? You know, who, who can, mm-hmm. who's, who can belong, you know? And then you're kind of always afraid. I feel like is what that creates. You're always afraid of like, well, Oh, if they only knew then maybe I'd be out next, you know? Right. Yeah. The, the hospital centers concept right. versus, you know, the, the, you know, yeah, right. Using them for those who are perfect kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you. And, 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 you know, it, thanks be to God. I think that the, the advent of the internet is, is ultimately going to, to it help the LDS church kind of, it has helped them. They're mm-hmm. having to deal with the things that were not shared, you know, mm-hmm. as widely for so long. They've, they're having to deal with those now. They have been having to deal with them. And mm-hmm. as things come out in the open, you know, um, uh, well, my prayer is that their theology will kind of morph itself into mm. something that's more in line and help bring yeah. pre- bring people closer. Um, mm-hmm. And I think we're see- I think we are seeing some of that in general. Um, like I said, the, this idea of regression of gods is not something, mm-hmm. at least from what I can tell, that it's as widely taught today as mm-hmm. it was just kind of openly taught long ago. Sure. Um, and and their theology is morphing. But yeah, I 100% agree. Openness is the key, mm-hmm. um, and just dealing with things and just admitting that you know we we all have our faults and we've all made mistakes, even popes. Um, mm-hmm. But you know, thanks be to God, we have that the gift of infallibility. You know, mm-hmm. for for you know for dogma. You know, for the things that are that are handed down, and mm-hmm. that that does not change. You know, and that we have those guardrails um, that that can protect us. Yeah, and I I think that as the world for for Christian people gets smaller, right? As the, as the world at large is more secularized and more hostile, it feels like it's getting that way. At least like it's, we're going to have to make friends with, with each other. (laughs) But I bet like, honestly, that's leading to these, these conversations. And I, and I think it's going to lead, I mean, ultimately I think between being persecuted right now, maybe softly, but like who knows what tomorrow holds, but the, the discomfort of now being Christian in the West to, maybe soft persecution in some areas, just culturally. I think it's only going to lead to to more unity, right? And, and the church is so open to that. You know, I, that's one of the, the things as a Protestant that I was really passionate about was church unity. And then seeing that the Catholic church had the forefront on those efforts, like they, they've they yeah. had dialogues oh, yeah. with everybody and they're open to it, obviously in a very particular way, which not everyone is in agreement about. <laughs> this is the way it should be done, but like they're open to like come come home, like you belong to us, and that's, yeah. that's such a that's well, such a Christ like attitude, you know. That that's what that's one of the things that I experienced coming over from Orthodoxy because mm-hmm. it, it's it's kind of the opposite. I mean, it, it's really interesting, you know. There's there's this funny meme that goes around the internet that you can see. It has uh, um, two people side by side, and you know it's you know. Uh, um, one person say a third person asking, you know, are, are you two friends? And on the person on the left says, yes. And it has above it Catholic. And yeah. on the right, it has no, and it has Orthodox, Orthodox above yeah. it. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, I've seen that and, and so, I mean, it, it's, but, but that is kind of funny, but it, you know, you're absolutely right. The Catholic church is, is mm-hmm. trying to practice ecumenism in the right way, in the proper, in the way. right way. Yeah. Not, not, not giving up on things that are truth, not giving up on things that are dogma, Right. But trying to highlight the things, the areas that we agree on, and mm-hmm. let's focus on those, you know, because there are multiple areas that we do, and trying to bring people into the into the church that way, you know, mm-hmm. through having having that dialogue and focusing on on the multitude of things mm-hmm. that that we agree on, and trying to work through those things that we disagree on, um, because yeah, I mean, there's you know, it, it I look at it like there's a spectrum, you know, there, there's a spectrum of truth, you know, of you know, it, the cl- and the closer you get, you know, the the fullness of the truth being Catholicism, you know, and over here you might have Mormonism, and here you've got Protestantism, and you get Orthodoxy, and then you get to to the fullness of the truth. And but there's mm-hmm. there's truth in all all of them, um, mm-hmm. to to a certain extent, mm-hmm. and you know, bringing people in through that. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I think we're seeing some of that. I mean, who knows? We may have. Uh, the Greek church may come into communion with orthodoxy in my lifetime. There's rumors of it, you know, where the Pope is talking to, mm-hmm. you know, Patriarch Bar- Bartholomew and they're celebrating things together. Uh, and, you know, the, the Rokor jurisdictions and the Russian church, they're not happy about that. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not, they're not liking what Bartholomew is doing. I, I but, I think, not. <laughs> but I think, 
but he he's even made some comments about you know uh, ultimately you know coming together with the Catholic Church being mm -hmm. you know in, in on the horizon you know so mm -hmm. maybe it will happen in my lifetime I would love to see that it. would be that would be amazing and it, it it would be really good because it'd be so contrary to what's happening in the world at large right now right I mean it would be inexplainable by by mere human capacity for two people two groups who have been separated for a thousand years to come together and, and have full reunion would be like it would have to be received by a lot of people as like a divine act because everything else in the world is getting more tense more divided it, it feels like and the internet you know is kind of responsible for a lot of that i think but it does seem that there's this you movement of the spirit towards that unity um i hope to see it i think there's real progress for sure like i don't think it would be unreasonable to see that in our lifetime um i hope so. i pray for that every day i think that'd be amazing and if it started with the orthodox and then then we could just slowly work our way through the protestant communion so there's <laughs> till there's nobody left but <laughs> it might just be Ro rocor standing out in the cold but um <laughs> <laughs> i hope well, not yeah. i think i think Ro Ro rocor would definitely probably rocor the russian church and the rocor would probably be the 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 last two in the Orthodox world for sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And then there'd yeah. be some, there'd be some like fundamentalist independent Baptist church out there somewhere too, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's so, that's incredible. Um, it is an interesting time. I mean, next year we're having Easter together. Is that, is that next year? Right. We're having, we're celebrating Easter at the same time. I think I haven't looked, I haven't, I, I, Pretty sure it is. I think I've read. Yeah. Some, I haven't looked, but I, I think I read something that it is. I'm pretty sure um, that we're observing Easter at the same time, which is amazing. It's that's really big news. And then there's some uh, observance of the Council of Nicaea that's going to be shared. Like I think the Pope is planning on traveling to Nicaea. Oh, cool! With the I Patriarch, yeah. Which that would be awesome. That'd, yeah, like that's maybe they'll announce it there. To, yeah, that'd be a proper <laughs> place to do it. You know. It really would, um, yeah, because three twenty-five. You know, I mean, it's yeah. it's it, it, next year being the, the anniversary. Yeah, that would be incredible. And yeah, then if hopefully. they did announce that, ooh, that was yep. some chills in my spine. One can hope. Uh, one can hope. Yeah, I mean, because especially with Orthodoxy, we're so close, right? I mean, like the fact that you had all the valid sacraments, so you're just making a confession of faith. That's as, that's that's. I mean, effectively that's as close as you can get to full communion, right? There's like one little footnote almost between, between the Orthodox and us. Um, whereas like when I came into the church, I did have to be, I had to be confirmed. So I was like missing one sacrament right before I could receive the Eucharist. Yeah. And for us, it was, we became, when we became Orthodox, we had to be, be, uh, chrismated, which is confirmed. Right. Yeah. Had, had to, had to be chrismated. So, mm -hmm. but we'd already had the, everybody except for Micah had, had already been baptized. So, yeah. It's, I mean, it's just, it's it's that close, but it's but it it's such a big deal, you know, with with the Pope because it speaks right. into so many things. Yeah. Um, but totally. all but all the things it speaks into are the things that bring unity. I mean, mm. that's that's really what it is. Right. It all, it speaks into so many things that br that bring unity, and mm. um, it's definitely needed. Yeah, and I think that's it's an interesting time for all that to be happening. Like, so for me, this is an interesting th thing just in my life as as I became Catholic, the more I started to work those things out, even in terms of like our political situation, right? Um, Western liberalism is so deconstructed with authority. so decentralized that what those, some of those problems that you mentioned just happening faith wise and orthodoxy are kind of happening on the, on the political grounds too. And what used to unify the West in terms of like principles, which really are just like Catholic values at some point. And even political structures is kind of untangling as well, it seems. So it's, it's interesting. Cause I feel like there's a movement of especially young people. They're not like a bunch, but there's a strong force of younger people coming towards more traditional forms of Christianity, which is so contrary to our age, right? Where like everyone mm -hmm. Absolutely. is taught yeah. to decentralize everything, disrespect all authority and just do whatever you want. But then to, to do the opposite of that would be to become Catholic, essentially, where it's like right. you have to follow this guy in the funny hat. He, you know, if he says you have to believe something dogmatically, then you have to. And now there's all these things that you have to order your life around, including going to church every Sunday. And you know, to the world at least, we have the strangest view on contraception, like the most backwards view to them. But but it's, there's a lot of good reasons we hold that view, and it makes sense morally and 
and all of that. But like, we're like, I, I just remember like when we told family members for the first time, like, oh yeah, we're following the church's teaching on that. They were like, what? You know, it yeah. seems like the weirdest thing <laughs> so that you you're could do. really <laughs> Catholic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, but I think that that's happening. It's almost like a, a counter movement, like counterculture in today's age, right? Is going to yeah, be I, I agree with you. <laughs> so, I, And I think or, orthodoxy and Catholicism are seeing yeah. uh, the, the benefits of that. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, and, and, so, and, and the Anglican church, some of the conservatives, more conservative Anglican churches mm-hmm. are seeing benefits of it where, you know, people are hungry for particularly the younger, younger uh, people. They're hungry for something which um, is sustainable, something that's right. been, that has some tradition to it, that has, mm-hmm. has meat to it. Um, because hyper individualism is so unsatisfying. I mean, yeah. it, it really is. I mean, it, and there's obviously reasons for that. I mean, you know, we can get into the theological, you know, that's really what Satan wants you to do. And, and you know, you, you sin ultimately causes you to collapse in on yourself. You know right. I mean? That, that's what it does. And so, you know, individualism does that, but when you're part of, a, 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 a community of believers that, you know, is, is, is spans the time, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you have that history there. It, it speaks to the soul, you know, and it helps to fill that void, you know, you're filling that void with God and you're connecting to God along with, um, you know, this great body of believers and, and seeing that and seeing the beauty of the tradition, the, the beauty of, a liturgical worship, uh, which elevates the soul. You know, mm. I don't need to go to church to, to hear rock and roll. I can turn the radio <laughs> on. I can go to Spotify. Right. I can fill myself with that, you know, mm-hmm. but to go to church and, and to be worshiping God in, in, in a manner that brings me out of myself, you know, mm. outside of myself and, and lifts the soul up. And, you know, the Eucharist is, is lifted up mm-hmm. and, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm adoring um, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it elevates. And right. I think the, 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 at least the, the, the people under 30 that I've talked to, um, that have made their way into, into the church. Um, they, they really feel that and, and they're hungry for it. Um, and I'm amazed. I mean, we had a, we had a kid, uh, I say kid, he was, I think 19, 20, um, in RCIA this year that, just amazed me. He came the mm. the first class he came to, and um, I'd never met him before. So I walked up, introduced myself, and my wife and I got to talking to him about why he was there. He was going to the local college here, UNCG, and we're like, "What brought you here?" He said, "I started reading Augustine," and we're like, "I'm like, oh wow, okay, <laughs> why?" <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, I, I, but but that's not the kicker. He's like, "Well, I'm like, well, what you know, his confessions." He's like, "Yeah, I was reading his confessions," and I said, "Oh, where did you pick it up?" He's like, "I got it at the local library." And wow. he goes, but it was in Greek or Latin. It was in Latin. <laughs> and, and I was like, wait, because it was, it was in Latin. And he goes, I don't know why I said Greek. You know, it was in Latin. And, he, and I'll go, wait a minute. You, you, you translated it? He goes, I could, do you, do you read Latin? He's like, no, I used a translator and I translated it. <laughs> and I'm like, you're, how old are you? And I'm like, you didn't get it off a of Kindle or something? Yeah, they he got goes, English no. He's copies, like, dude. <laughs> I'm like, English copies. He he read, he had been reading Augustine. Oh, he was so hilarious. hungry for it that he had translated it himself through, through using a translator. Google translate is like, or, what are you or, making me do? <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, man, that is amazing. Wow. And, but but he came into the church, you know, and, and um, Praise God. he's just captive. He was captivated by the beauty. Um, and, and just, he was hungry for that. And I've yeah. seen that over and over again, at least in the last couple of years, I've seen it mm-hmm. over and over again. Yeah. had another kid who's the only, only one to, he's a high, senior in high school, only one in his family, um, who converted. We have a guy, a young kid who is uh, serving, um, uh, um, in the, uh, uh, mass. Uh, he's serving uh, as an altar server in the mass. He's, uh, graduating high school next year as art of discern. He wants to go into the priesthood. He's going to go directly. Nice. Um, uh, uh, to, to, you know, to seminary and I mean, already, already discerned it at the age of wow. 17. That's wow. what he wants to do. And, um, that there, and every single one of them are, are captivated by the beauty and the history the tradition mm-hmm. and what you described there, not 
attending something that 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 just speaks to the, to their soul, the worship mm-hmm. that speaks to their soul. Yeah, it, so. it just sets everything in its proper place, right? And I mean, it's it's so obvious, I think, to people who have just grown up knowing nothing different. It's so obvious that there's something kind of broken about the Western secular values that have sort of emerged and. Um, I don't want to use too strong of a word, but kind of cannibalized a lot of, of what was before it. Right. Pe- to, to oh, people, to. yeah. To people in my generation or younger, if that's all you've known is sort of the decay phase, right. There's something about our humanity that just is designed for, obviously designed for more designed for God. And it, it naturally starts to come out when there's no, well, when there's nothing feeding it. So no, that's not surprising to me at all. I mean, we see seen similar things in our parishes that some of the younger guys, even younger than me that are like really just on fire and yeah, doing really epic things, doing really epic things for, for their age. Um, and such intensity too, such intensity. So yeah, I mean, this, yeah. this medium here, you know, YouTube podcast and stuff is, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and, and, and you know, people from your generation that are using it to grow the faith and to spread the word. Um, it, it you guys being on fire. That's, that's awesome. It is. Yeah. yeah, The podcasting thing is interesting too, because there's so much, (laughs) there's so much stuff on the internet that we have no business. I'm starting to like, look at it as a mission field, if that makes sense, because I don't know. I I don't know, man. The, The more I think about like what the internet is doing to us, I think there's going to be a day when genuinely the reason people become Catholic is we're like some of the few people that actually have real authentic relationships, you know, it's going to, it might be like that easy where we actually see people face to face and know them and talk. And it's, it's easy for even Catholics to get kind of hijacked by some of the digital culture things that it's so easy to get stuck into being afraid and uh, and angered by everything. But there's a lot of good Catholic people who are doing this and then, but then like turning off and, and living a normal life and, and not drawing their meaning or their value from this place, but like this is like the mission field, right? Uh, and I think actually Pope oh. Benedict t- uh, coined the term the digital continent. And when I read that, it was in one of his World Communication Day talks. Because um, every year the popes do this. I don't know this until recently. They like do a World Communications Day speech about global communications and media and stuff. And ever since the iPhone, it's pretty much all been about social media. And he <laughs> coined the term the digital continent, that there's people – who are exploring almost this new uncharted territory. Uh, and it's like a mission field. And ever since I've read that, it's been, it's struck home. Cause it really in some ways feels that way. A cause yeah, we find people who are born there, like the digital natives and stuff, and then get to kind of evangelize to them and then help rescue people who have, you know, like it's an isolating place otherwise, um, which is endlessly ironic to say through like a zoom call to somebody <laughs> that you're going to put their podcast on the internet. But that's kind of what I've been thinking about with those things lately. Cause it's, it's especially with AI and stuff, it's just getting, it's getting less personal and less human than it was. And it already was kind of like distant, you know? So. Yeah. It's one of the, I like how, I like how Bishop Barron approaches it. You know, he's like, mm. it's something that you use, you yeah. know, but you, you, you don't let it get control of you. And Matt, Matt, Matt Fratt is, you know, I think he was, he take the month of September, I think completely off. Yeah. Quickly. I used to. Yeah. I don't know if he does, I don't know if he anymore, does that anymore, but it was but, cool. But yeah. Yeah, for a while there, he was doing that where he would just turn everything off for a whole month. But I mean, as long as it can be a tool, you know, it can be a right. tool that that we use and that it doesn't get control of us, that we don't become mm-hmm. addicted to it, we don't become a slave to it, which is challenging. I mean, you know, it, it is because it's so easy just to turn it on and even listen to good things, even listen to good things, but just mm-hmm. like you know, that's all I'm doing. If that's all I'm doing with my free time, it's like, well, this, it, it something good can become something bad. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's all about our own appetites and our own, you know, becoming a slave, a slave to, to, to sin. You know, it's, it's a challenge. It it is, it's definitely a challenge and AI. Oh yeah. AI is a whole (laughs) other topic. That's a whole three hour conversation. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. That's that. That's, it's crazy. It's a little bit. I don't know what, I don't know what to think about that. I don't know what to think about AI. I really don't. Yeah. Like I see good, good and bad. Yeah, Good and oh, bad. for sure, for sure. It's like anything. I mean, there's going to be a lot of the stuff they'll talk about publicly will be the endless optimism of how this is going to fix everything. But then the bad side will kind of rear its head, you know, like with social media, I think we're just now getting to a point where people are like, hey, that kind of was a lot to throw at human psychology for the past 20 years, don't you think? You know, 
but with AI, I think it's going to be a whole nother deeper level of that in some, in some sense. I mean, um, and, and, and just, it's interesting because all at once it's going to change how we relate to each other or keep people relating to like machines and not even having to talk to humans. But man, if you've had to have it write an email or like a script draft for you, it's pretty nice. It's very fast <laughs> and it does a good job. So it's like, uh, it's, um, yeah, I've not, I've not done that yet. I oh yeah. We, to. I tried it once and I was, cause I mean, we do video production for a living. So I'm writing scripts weekly and there was one week where I was like, whatever, I'm just going to see what it does. And I was mad at how, like, I wouldn't have used it as the final, not even close, but it, for like a for just something that it spit out in eight seconds i was very upset at how workable it was um <laughs> it's like I, I was like dang that took me like two hours on my own time but that just spit that out in eight seconds and i changed everything but it still was like the bones of something that you could you could have shot a video yeah it gave you something you could edit you could yeah, edit more yeah. work, work with yeah and then you're like why did i spend so much time doing that that way it's yeah it's interesting stuff for sure wow um Daryl, well, that's a that's an amazing journey you've been on, huh? That's what you said. Thirty years between when you were talking to Pete and now, basically, is that right? Or yeah. Coming up, I on mean, it was it was because it was thirty years ago. My my wife, my wife and I, yeah, we it's thirty thirtieth anniversary from when I joined the LDS Church this year. Okay. Wow. And so yeah, yeah. So the and so we and we moved to Montrose in ninety five. So wow. And that's when you know I met Pete. So. Yeah. It's, and then, it's wild. It's wild. Yeah. That's why I've got all these gray hair. It's a lot of different denominations to be reading about very intensely over the course of 30 years. Like, I think most people are probably like, I got like one good year of research in me and then you commit to one and you kind of stay there. But I think it's good that, that you took it that seriously though. Right. I mean, I wish I could get, this is what I find. I get frustrated when like, someone cares, but like not enough to like do the deep dive, right? Not, not enough to do the oh, research yeah. and take it all the way there. So that, and that, and that's one of the bad things that I, I think that I, 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 I call it like the, the billboard mentality of, mm. of theology and of history of like, you know, you got to get things down into where you can fit it into two sentences and put, put it on the billboard on the side of the road or put it yeah. in, in, a, in a little, in a little Instagram post or, you know, or, or, or Twitter post or whatever. Mm. Twi- and, and if you can't, then it's not worth, you know, di- but you know, that's not how things work. I mean, right. you know, it, it, you gotta, you have to go deeper than that. You have to be willing to do the hard work. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it, it, that's one of the back, b- bad things I think that has come out of social media is it's shortened mm-hmm. everybody's attention span, shortened the ability to, c- to kind of do those deep dive. Mm-hmm. And that's why like things like this where people can sit down and have a two-hour conversation, you know, or like things like the, the long-form format like Matt Frad does, like mm-hmm. Joe Rogan does, you know. I think there's there's something to that. And I think things are moving back that direction and, and mm-hmm. being willing to, to put in the hard work and do that. Um, it, it, God rewards that. I mean, he really does. And um, I'm just glad he's faithful mm. in, in all of it and got us where we are. Yeah. It's an amazing story. I mean, the, it, it really is. Uh, before the interview, I told you, like, I want to be interrupting you all the time. And I wasn't because I was like, wait, I just got to hear what he's going to say next. It was um, engaging and, and really, man, I think a lot of people who watch this are probably going to benefit from everything you're saying. So thanks for coming on and sharing, uh, sharing absolutely. With us. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Th- thanks for having me. And, you know, mm-hmm. feel free to put my, I'll, I'll give you my email address and people, and you can put it okay, in the sure. um, show notes or anything. If you want to, I'll, I'll, I'll send that to you and you can have that. And, okay. um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk to anybody who, who is researching and has questions or whatever. Um, there's a lot of things we obviously we couldn't go into, you know, in mm-hmm. detail. There's a lot more to it, but I'm happy to, to talk to anybody who, um, you may have questions. Awesome. Well, that's very nice of you. Thank Feel you. Thank you for having you, me. It's been a lot. If you open that door fun. and you ever need to shut it, just let me know. <laughs> Cause you never know. Like you might start getting some weird emails too, but uh, people will definitely take you up on that. So um, is there Absolutely. anything else that you're doing? Are you still writing blogs or doing anything like that that you want to plug? Um, not right now. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, I, I, I do occasionally, um, you know, but uh with teaching RCI and doing some of the things in the church, I've kind of been diving into more of that. Um, sure. I got it out of my system after leaving the LDS church, you know, <laughs> where I got some of that anger out of my system mm-hmm. and, um, you know, I've kind of stepped out of doing that, that some, I may, I may enter into back into it one day. 
So. Yeah, no, you should. I mean, I think with your experiences and everything, it's definitely stuff that people would read. You start a podcast. That's what everyone. That's, that's what everyone's doing. I can give you some <laughs> tips or something. <laughs> yeah, you, oh, you, you, you put in a lot of work. I appreciate it. you have you have a no, good show thanks. here, man. I've listened to listened to several thanks. of them. So, I appreciate that. It's a, a lot of work. I know. Especially it's with the fun family, though. So. It's so fun. I mean, just to get to talk to all you know, all sorts of different people and hear their stories. It. It is work, but at some point you're just like, I, I enjoy it so much. And these are the types of conversations I'd be having anyway. So I'm like, I might as well just record them and put them out there and see what happens. And yeah, it's kind of funny. I mean, we just passed. So almost what, like two days ago, I think I just passed 4,000 subscribers, which I was like, whoa, that's awesome. <laughs> weird. That's awesome. It's weird to think about that many people being like, oh yeah, I want to subscribe to that guy. I'm like, oh, if you only knew <laughs> you would, yeah. you would not be <laughs> subscribing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a fun journey. It's just like anything, right? You just put a little bit of time in consistently enough and then it, it can go somewhere. But, um, but it really is just a passion thing too. Like getting to have conversations like this. And then when the stories start flooding into the people it's helped, you know, like back in January, I was kind of like, I don't know, I'm like, am I actually doing any good here? Or is it just kind of like self-serving, you know? Cause if it is, I have things I need to be doing as well, like obligations with the family that I could certainly use that time for, but we got emails multiple at this point of people being like, Hey, you know, I just came into the church and this podcast kind of helped. And it, it's never like the first thing, which I'm, it's, that's great. I don't really want the the glory or anything. That's all for Jesus. But it's these podcasts is like what people incubate with, right? Like they'll have that initial curiosity oh, yeah. and then they'll just, yeah. Pines with Aquinas, Bishop You're Barron. planting seeds. Yeah, yep. exactly. So and it's a it's safe easy. medium people can go to and hear different mm -hmm. people's stories, get, get their questions answered. It's not as threatening because they're not yeah. having to talk to somebody about it. And right. and, and it, you're, you're do, definitely doing the Lord's work. And so I, I commend you for it because I know it's a lot of work, like I said, especially with you know having a young family. I know that it, it – so. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate I'm that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. with the new one. Everyone's probably heard my, my youngest one month old son just crying upstairs the whole time. My, my wife is with them just so everyone knows. It's not like he's just being <laughs> left there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. Well, yeah. Thanks again, Daryl. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, yeah, and, absolutely. And sharing your story. Uh, and thanks to everyone for watching. Um, and if you stuck around this long, let us know what your favorite part of his journey was. Um, and yeah, I mean, everyone, this is a really amazing episode, really amazing story. If you benefited from it, please share it with somebody, you know, that you think could benefit, you know, from it, whether it's someone that has a similar journey to Daryl's that could, you know, uh, could learn something or someone that's going through that right now, or just somebody you think would find it industry, uh, interesting. So, um, and uh, as always make sure you like, and subscribe, which I, the button's not working. I spent all that time before we started fixing it and it's not working, but you can still hit the subscribe button if you're enjoying the content. Uh, and just wanted to update you guys real quick. Uh, just pretty much a month from now, I'll be heading to Steubenville for the creator conference with Kyle Whittington and a bunch of other people and doing some content there. Uh, and then right after that to the Eucharistic Congress. So July is going to be a crazy month on Drew the Catholic. Uh, lots of content coming your way. As soon as I know details on like what's going to happen, I'll let you know, but I don't know yet. So we're getting close and I don't know exactly what we'll be filming. So I'll let you guys know and make sure you stick around for that though. Uh, and also, this is a good time if you guys have been watching for a while and you're benefiting from it, make sure you get more involved in our community. You can head over to drewthecatholic.locals.com and check out what we're doing there. And if you feel led to financially support what we're doing, that's the place to do that as well. Uh, but with that, thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you next time on Drew the Catholic.